These people are primitive. Things that are natural to them might shock and horrify you. Well, I'm not easily frightened. That may be the pity of it. Every once in a while someone will ask me, isn't it harder to frighten people during the summertime? But horror fiction is in the business of breaking rules and crossing boundaries, and it will not be contained by something as prosaic as the seasons or the weather. As today's wide-ranging stories will prove, even at the height of summer, the darkness is never far away. Hi, my name is Maura McHugh and welcome to my home. Uh, before we start I should say this is a giant wicker man poster above my head so if you see some scary animals sticking out at the side it's 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 nothing strange creeping up it's just a reminder of one of my favorite films uh, this is my living room. So my name is Maura McHugh I am a writer across multimedia. I do comics, prose, uh, a bit of theatre, uh, film, and uh, I write a lot of horror and science fiction as well, actually, but uh, I always have a streak of horror in my work. Uh, today, oh, oh, and I should say thanks to Joe uh, Freeman for inviting me to be part of this. I want to get that up front before I forget. Um, I'm going to read a story uh, from my collection, The Boughs Withered, When I Told Them My Dreams. And in fact, I'm reading the title story, which I wrote for the collection. Um, and I'm going to read from the acknowledgements at the back. So just to explain the his a bit of the history of this, um, the collection gets its title from the new story, The Boughs Withered, When I Told Them My Dreams, which was inspired by a W.B. Yeats poem called The Withering of the Boughs. I had been searching for a title for the collection when I read the two-line refrain. No boughs have withered because of the wintry wind. The boughs have withered because I have told them my dreams. That last line gave me goosebumps and while the meter worked for the poem, it didn't work for the story title, so I cheekily amended it to suit my purposes. The story turned up in response to the title. And I'll just continue this small little bit at the end, because 
I think it's uh, pertinent. There is a Yeats connection to me as I live a short drive from Tour Balali, the medieval fortified tone, stone tower in which Yeats resided for years. It influenced much of his poetry, including his important volume, The Tower, from 1928. And it's where he conducted magical work and seances with his wife, George Hyde Leeds. Uh, close by is an atmospheric wooded estate of Cool Park, former residence of playwright writer Lady Augusta Gregory. Many of Ireland's literary luminaries of the late 19th and early 20th century frequented this neighbourhood. When I walk under the whispering branches of the knowing trees in Cool Park, I am threading through the echoes of our creative past and I am inspired, refreshed and uplifted. So yeah, I have, I'm a big fan of trees. That's anyone who like follows my Instagram or <laughs> anything like that would see. I'm always, and I always out in the woods. I find it deeply, uh, you know, inspiring. And the woods appear so much in horror and fairy tales. It's no surprise. It's this kind of catonic, um, deeply connected quality to them, you know and their age and you feel if you stand beneath them you can hear things <laughs> so i like to think i think anyway um before i start meandering too much i will um start reading the story uh the boughs withered when i told them my dreams by maura McHugh. the woman rushed joanna as she opened her car door excuse me mrs Wynne. She gasped. Startled, it took Joanne a moment to recognise her since the wind spun her fine dark hair into cobwebs across her face. Memory jolted into action. She was part of the coterie of parents at the school drop-off in the era before Oscar was too embarrassed to be seen in the company of his mother. Neve Coleman, the name drifted up to rescue Joanne from the embarrassment as the woman finished a jerky introduction. The boys had been in a play together, Christopher, never Chris, she recalled. She hadn't seen Neve since their sons graduated St. Joseph's. They engaged in a stilted exchange of information. Christopher was studying drama, Oscar was doing a business degree, catching up via exchanging information about other people. It's lovely to see you again, Neve, Joanna began as a preamble to leave and placed her hand upon the car door again. It was getting dark. She wanted the boundaries of home and an escape from unwanted presences. She had had enough of intrusions. I know this is odd, Joanna, but Neve looked up. Her expression was strained. Joanna felt a spike of fear. Was she being asked for money? Have you ever visited the Crone House? Sorry, what's that? Had Neve turned into a new age boor? The only son had left the nest, so she poured herself into another vocation. It wasn't as if Joanna wasn't familiar with the ache, but that's what hobbies or jobs were for. Perhaps a cat. It's in the woods by the hospital. It's old, before the housing estate was built. Three women lived there, always three. She started to speed up, having noticed Joanna's recoil. It's not officially Crone House, that's just the nickname, because of the women. They're elderly, you see. I've no idea what you're talking about. Joanna heard the sharpness in her voice and wanted it there as a warning. Neve sighed. I know this is weird. I don't want to upset your evening. You look tired. It's just they can help you. What are you talking about? Anger stirred in her, so when Neve placed her hand on her arm, she yanked back from it. Neve held on. I dreamt about them last night. They said they can help you, with the man. Joanna froze. They helped me once, you know, having Christopher. Uh, you had IVF. Yes, three rounds. Then, them. And it cost me. Her mouth twisted into a skein of pain. But I have Christopher now, so it was worth it. Joanna felt Neve's fingers dig in through the padding of her jacket. I'm obliged to pass the message on. What you do with it is your business, but if they've offered help, you must need it. Neve released her hold and patted the spot apologetically. A gust of wind obscured her face again with a haze of hair. 
but it will cost you. She dropped her head and turned, walked furtively, her shoulders hunched. Joanna sat down in her car seat with a thud. She had seen his type before, the young brash fellow who took up a little too much space and talked a little too loud. His jokes were ribald, but not rude enough to annoy anyone important. Just enough to pinpoint how far he could take it the next time. Connor Bo Brophy knew how to flatter and do just enough work at the right moment to appear industrious. Joanna was part of the old guard in her department, efficient, reliable and the keeper of legacy information about the company. She maintained professional distance at work. It paid the bills, but she knew she wasn't there for friendship. She knew some people thought her aloof, but she planned to retire from full-time work in another five years. Oscar would finish uni that summer and already had a job lined up with a financial firm in Dublin. He had mapped out his career since he was 15, the year after his dad died. He'd even started dating an equally poised lad called Ben. They were serious, but Oscar was serious about everything. Despite her rule to maintain a calm demeanor at, wor demeanor at work, Joanna could not ignore Con Connor. He was always in the kitchen with his banter or playing hilarious squawky videos on his phone to anyone in the room. Joanna no longer liked to be in there. Before, she always enjoyed sitting on the high stool by the counter with her back to the room for a break with her cup of Milky Barry's tea and a hobnob. He developed a habit of stopping by Monica's cubicle whenever he passed. This meant he hung over her partition, partially in her space. She despised his badly ironed shirt, perpetually half pulled out, his silly superhero socks and skewed nylon tie. Nothing he did was complete or precise, yet he had a way of inveigling others to cover for him. Joanna recognised the ratcheting resentment she harboured toward him and realised she was showing it through barbed comments about punctuality and neat dress. He always turned her comments around to depict her as a prim or act lacking a sense of humour. Worse, she recognised those tra traits in herself because she disliked them too. They were not patterns of behaviour she longed to untie, but the knots defied her. More and more, she found her thoughts obsessing over every zinger he launched at work or his lazy and formal style of writing emails. During the drive home, she'd clench the steering wheel and replay conversations they'd had that day, but with added damning commentary. She considered her Le Espirit de Lotto. She was capable of wit when given a little time. It came to a head during a meeting about their biggest client. Connor made a significant error when calculating their bill in the coming quarter. When reading through the reports, she'd noted the mistake, but waited for the meeting to point it out. The boss was annoyed and praised Joanna for her close attention. She relished the moment, but in the periphery of her vision, she spotted the red hatred heating Connor's face, and it stirred unease in her. From that time forward, it was war. Nothing direct, but a constant picking on everything Joanna said or did. No slip up was too small for Connor to correct. No comment was too innocent that it couldn't be transformed into a ridiculous jibe. She raised the matter once with her superior and was informed that Connor had already complained that her impossible high standards were a cover for bullying. She was warned to be more considerate. Someone hacked her Facebook page and covered it in derogatory gay porn. She felt humiliated and stressed during the days it took to sort it out, and Oscar was appalled. Ben had seen it. She began to worry that Connor had installed software on her computer at work that was keeping tabs on everything she did. She could be under surveillance. There were cameras in every screen, and they could be hidden anywhere. She'd seen a TV show about it. Her personal email address was used to register for hookup sites. Going through the rigmarole to end the lewd messages drained her. She considered changing her email address, except she used the same one for 12 years. And she worried that Connor would uncover her new one anyway. 
Perhaps he had hacked her home laptop. She bought and installed software to detect malware and beef up her firewall. She placed tape over the camera to prevent spying. She had no confidence it would keep him at bay. Determined people always find a way, one expert explained. Text messages arrive late at night from strange numbers. I will slit your throat and watch you die choking on your own blood, said one. She reported the incident to the guards. They took it seriously, but added it to their list of things to investigate. Likely just a crank, they stated, but instructed her to keep records of everything. She had to turn off her computer and phone at night to bring peace, but it didn't extend to her mind. She had no refuge, no place of safety. Her sleep suffered. Every workday, she had to meet Connor and paste on a mask of indifference. He avoided being rude to her in front of others, but smirked and rolled his eyes at everything she said. Her colleagues began to treat her differently. Where before she was trusted, now she was micromanaged. 20 years of diligence undermined in six months by a canny idiot. She drove by the house slowly. It waited at the end of a path secured with an iron gate choked in ivy. The trees grew close on three sides like conspiratorial friends. It was a grey two-storey house, neglected but ordinary. Yet she, as she crawled past, she felt like she was being sized up. She didn't have the nerve to orchestrate another drive-by. Someone might notice. It was a populated spot that was cunningly hedged away from neighbours. As she turned the car wheel to leave, waves of rooks erupted from the woods in a raucous flood. It looked like the trees were bleeding black blood into the air. Her breath seized in her throat. Her foot hit the accelerator. Behind her, the clamour of rooks smudged her view. That night, Joanna dreamed about the crones. The strangled gate opened with a stifled protest. Above, a smoking chimney tilted on the bowed roof. The tall windows were veiled by jaundiced lace curtains and the front door had a brass knocker in the shape of a snarling wolf's head. It growled low when she approached through the thickening twilight but the door swung open. A long, dim hallway past a darkened staircase led to the kitchen. She passed a living room where aged furniture mouldered and motes of black dust hung suspended in the air. Standing by the cold fireplace were three children wearing white shifts. The tallest with a fox's head, the middle one with its crow head cocked to one side, and the littlest with the hare's head, unblinking big eyes and long ears. The fox's yellow eyes gleamed and it licked its sharp teeth. Mother, it growled. Monster, the crow crawled. Myth, the hare whispered. The dream granted its logic. Joanna nodded at the child beasts and moved on. The women waited in the kitchen, the oldest a hoary hag with long silver hair and bright bird-like e eyes, perched on top of a high stool, her knees by her ears. A stout woman with a plaited rope of grey hair curled around her head, rolled out dough on a sturdy oak table. A pie dish lay beside her, piled with glistening meat. Nearby, the gutted carcass of a rabbit and a flensing knife. Gore splattered her apron. By the antique range, the last woman, tall with short white hair standing upright on her head, stirred a huge cauldron with a pitted white stick. She was all lean muscle and angles. The heat from the range permeated the room, but there was little light. Candles dotted the shelves and nooks, and the long wide window over the sink looked out into a wild garden, barely visible in the advancing night. A massive gnarled tree dominated the view. So you came, 
said the pie maker, busy with her work. You knew she would, replied her sister, stirring madly. Will you help me? Joanna asked. She knew these ladies would have no truck with preamble. Their lives were measured by a shorter scale. You have it in you, the woman at the table noted. She lifted her skin of dough carefully and laid it upon her pie dish. It depends on what you want. Squatting on her tall perch, the oldest cackled and shook her head. Hush, mother, said the one by the range. At that, mother leaped across the room as agile as a monkey and landed on the back of the woman to yank at tufts of her hair. Joanna expected bedlam, but instead the tallest reached around and with an impossible movement lifted the mother off her back and circled her to the front so she was cradled like a baby. She lifted her shirt and offered her small depleted breast to the crone, who latched on and suckled with gusto. She rocked and crooned the bundle of old bone and hair. Joanna pretended she did not want to gag. Tell the tree, the pie maker said, and nodded to the window, and then we'll see. And you'll pay, the tall woman added, and all three howled. Joanna walked to the door. The women became motionless with intent. The round handle turned smoothly in her palm, allowing her access to the garden. Outside, the air was bruised purple-black, but the sky was cloudless, so the marvel of the stars were, was visible. But it was a strange array of lights. Joanna had no, was no expert, but their arrangement appeared replicated, as if many skies lay upon each other, but slightly out of sync. The thick roots of the huge tree boiled out of the grass, a tangle of serpentine damp root knots. She could not ascertain the girth of the trunk, and as it towered so high, it was impossible to determine where its branches ended and the sky began. She clambered over the coils, slipping, aware of the women's gaze upon her from the kitchen window. The tree's bark was craggy, like primordial rock, and yet there was a faint warmth when she laid her hand upon it. Its vast expanse was covered in whorls and cracks, but she noticed a section which evoked the memory of the angle of her mother's jaw when she tilted her head to listen to one of Joanna's questions. She sidled to it and lay her cheek against the rough surface. A fierce longing erupted in her chest for the surety of childhood, when she had believed that someone watched over her, taking care of all the bad things in the world. But it was temporary, an illusion. Her mother couldn't protect her from betrayal and loss. Sometimes she had caused it. Tell me your dreams, daughter. And she poured out the rot inside her, the fury that curdled within her constantly and her elaborate fantasies for revenge. The tree seemed to sigh, settle, and a creaking began above her that escalated into a squealing wail. Joanna looked up. The boughs were withering. They darkened, twisted, and shriveled until they became blighted, vestigial nubs. She glanced at the window. The three crones watched with rapt delight. Joanna picked her way through the swirls of roots, unsure of her path, but aware she had power. She returned to the kitchen and the old women carved her a slice of their pie. It tasted delicious. Joanna rose from her bed, imperious. She stood in the middle of her bedroom with its bland walls and unassuming decorations. It did not recognize any part as representing her whole. This was the illusion, a cocoon she had spun from digested fear and shame. She picked up the frame picture on her bedside table of her late husband Dermot with Oscar, taken at an All-Ireland hurling match when Oscar was six. Oscar had hated the crowds, the noise and the game itself, but his father had insisted he come, trying to duplicate a beloved memory from his childhood, determined that Oscar feel the way he had felt a generation later. 
and Joanna had traipsed along with them, organising sandwiches and soft drinks, keeping the peace between the disappointed man and the sulky boy, and coaxing a false cheery photo from the disaster of expectations. Joanna noticed the unhappy strain around her son's eyes and the angry loop of her husband's arm made around Oscar's shoulders. Why would she want to look at this image every day? There were better pictures of Dermot and Oscar's Instagram account was full of photos of him and Ben together, laughing, sure of each other. She smashed her fist into the middle of the picture frame and the glass shattered, cutting her knuckles. She threw the mess into her bin. Blood dripped on the snowy white carpet. She glanced at the pattern and twisted her arm so the drops created a jagged circle with a man at its centre. She slashed a line across its thin throat. She smiled and dressed for trouble. Joanna strode into the office with a new haircut and boxes of artisanal doughnuts. She listened as her co-workers ate their sweet treats and drank coffee and she even cracked a few jokes. She told them to call her Joe. When Connor appeared, she made sure to stand too close to him and look directly in the eyes when he spoke. She could smell his confusion. She went out to lunch instead of hiding in her cubicle. Once she cracked open her guard, allies materialised. Connor had pestered a lot of people. Getting access to Connor's phone and PC was easy. He was careless and predictable. His password was hidden under his keyboard. After that, evidence emerged. She wasn't the only target of his harassment. He was digitally stalking his ex-girlfriend and one of his co-workers at his old job. Luckily for Joanna, she had used the work machine to maintain his vendettas and after that it was a matter of tipping off the IT department that something might be awry with Connor's digital, digital practices. He was marched out of the office by a security guard and Joanna was called into a meeting with HR where they sensitively explained what they had discovered on Connor's computer. Joanna realised they were angling to cover their liability. She was gracious, but negotiated a raise, extra holidays and an assistant. They disclosed their discovery to the guards and Joanna heard through the office rumour mill that he was being prosecuted by his ex. It wasn't enough. Joanna knew with a clear certainty that he would begin to feign pen penitence and present a defence as a socially awkward bumbler, get the lenient judge who disbelieved harpy women, and Connor would return to re destroying people's lives because that's the only way he could feel powerful. In her bedroom, the symbol in the carpet had dried into rusty flakes. She lit a candle and sat before it with the darkness upon her back. She remembered how the boughs withered. And she sang of her corrosive dreams and they seeped out of her and into the carpet. They sought out the jagged circle and poured into it. Inside, the man writhed as the line looped around his neck. Three pairs of bony hands supported her shoulders. Three mouths joined in with her song. Their music stirred her hair and the man's legs danced as he hanged. Joanna laughed and the crones behind her jabbered. And you'll pay, she heard. Gladly, she replied. Joanna walked to the house on a thin winter's day with a bag in her hand. Six figures in black shuffled down the narrow path with a coffin on their shoulders. The hearse waited, but no one else. The two crones lingered inside the doorway, safe in the shadows of the house. At the window, the beast children had flipped up the yellow lace to watch their mother depart. They raised a din of farewell. Joanna felt a twang for Oscar, but she had given him the best of herself. Now she would savour her worst. Joanna waited for the hearse to depart before opening the green coated gate. The end. <laughs> um, a 
should mention as well the story was actually selected for John Connolly's um, fantastic collection uh, Shadow Voices 300 Years of Irish Genre Fiction uh, it was actually the last story in, in the collection it, is, it was an incredible honour to be uh, for, for that so I, I would also recommend that anthology if anyone wants to have a look at the real interesting uh, sweep of Irish speculative fiction there is um, um, and so yes my name's Maura McHugh you can find me quite easily um, on Twitter Substack uh, Instagram they're kind of the places that uh, you'd see me most and I have a website of course which is splinister.com and that's it I hope you enjoyed the story and uh, and maybe you can if you want to read more of my work that collection is easily available online um, you can get it as Kindle or you can get it from Yukon Press which is based in the UK I think they might even some have some of the hardbacks uh, there but it's it's easy to pick up on Kindle and then you know I write in a number of different uh, places but if you follow me or uh, you'll 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 figure out what I'm doing uh, and that's it. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Peter James, and I'm delighted to be reading a short story for the amazing Joseph Freeman's Midsummer Macabre. I'm particularly thrilled because Joe actually is my oldest fan. I first met him when he was 14 years old, and he came to the Festival of Fantastic Films, where one of my first horror movies Death Dream was showing, and we had been like pen buddies ever since, and he's just an all-round great guy. So I'm going to be reading a short story from my collection, A Twist of a Knife. The volume is actually being reissued this Christmas with some great updates, and I hope you enjoy this little offering. It's called Venice Aphrodisiac. The first time they came to Venice, Johnny had told his wife he was on an important case. Joy had told her husband she was going to see her Italian relatives. In the large, dingy hotel room with its window overlooking the Grand Canal, they tore off each other's clothes before they'd even unpacked and made love to the sound of lapping water and water taxis blattering past outside. She was insatiable, they both were. They made love morning, noon and night only venturing out for food to stoke their energy. On that trip, they barely even took time out to see the sights of the city. They had eyes only for each other, horny eyes, each greedy for the other's naked body. They were aware that they had precious little time. Johnny whispered to her that Woody Allen, whose movies they both loved, was once asked if he thought that sex was dirty, and Woody had replied, only if you're doing it right. So they did it right, over and over again, and in between they laughed a lot. Johnny told Joy she was the sexiest creature in the world. She told him, no, he was. One time, when he was deep inside her, she whispered into Johnny's ear, let's promise each other to come back and make love here in this room every year forever. Even after we're dead, he said, why not? You're stiff when you're dead, aren't you? Stiff as a gondolier's oar. You're a wicked woman, Joy Jackson. You wouldn't like me if I wasn't, you horny devil. We could come back as ghosts, couldn't we, and haunt this room? We will. 
Two years later, acrimoniously divorced and free, they married and they honeymooned in Venice in the same hotel, a former palazzo, in the same room. While they were there, they vowed, as before, to return to the same room every year for their anniversary, and they did so without fail. In the beginning, they always got naked long before they got around to unpacking. Often, after dining out, they felt so horny they couldn't wait until they got back to the hotel. One time they did it late at night in a moored gondola. They did it beneath the Rialto Bridge and under several other bridges. Venice cast its spell. Coming here was an aphrodisiac to them. They drank Bellinis and their favourite Cathy in Piazza San Marco, swigged glorious white wines from the Fiuli district and gorged on grilled seafood in their favourite restaurant, the Cortisconta, which they always got lost trying to find every year. Some mornings spent with passion, they'd hop on an early water taxi and drink espressos and grappa on the Lido at sunrise. Later, back in their dimly lit hotel room, they would take photographs of each other naked and film themselves making love. One time for fun, they made plaster of Paris impressions of what Joy liked to call their rude bits. They were so in lust, nothing esteemed could stop them or could ever change. Once on an early anniversary, they visited Isola de San Michel, Venice's cemetery island. Staring at the graves, Johnny asked her, are you sure you're still gonna fancy me when I'm dead? Probably even more than when you're alive, she had replied, if that's possible. We'll have to do it quietly so we don't wake up the graveyard, she had replied. You're a bad girl, he had said before kissing her on the lips. You'd never have loved me if I was good, would you? Nah, he said, probably not. Let me feel your awe. That was then. Now it was 35 years later. They tried and failed to start a family. For a while it had been fun trying and eventually they'd accepted their failure. A lot of water under the bridge, or rather, all 409 of Venice's bridges. They'd seen each one and walked over most of them. Johnny ticked them off on a coffee-stained list he brought with him each year, and which became more and more creased each time he unfolded it. Johnny was a box ticker, she'd come to realise. I, I like to see things in tidy boxes, he would say. He said it rather too often. Only joking, he said when she told him she was fed up hearing this. They say there's many a true word spoken in jest, but privately he was not jesting. Plans were taking shape in his mind. Plans for a future without her. In happier times, they shared a love of Venetian glass I used to go across to the island of Murano on every trip to see their favourite glass factory, Novita Murano. They filled their home in Brighton with glass ornaments, vases, candlesticks, paperweights, figurines, goblets, glass of every kind. They say that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, and they didn't. Not physical ones, just metaphorical ones. More and more. The stones had started the day she peeked on his computer. Johnny had been a police officer, a homicide detective. She had worked in the Divisional Intelligence Unit of the same force. After he had retired at 49, he'd become bored. He managed to get a job in a fulfillment department of a mail-order company that supplied framed cartoons of bad puns involving animals. Their best-selling cartoon range was one with pictures of bulls on. Bullshit, bulldash, bullish, and so on. Johnny sat at the computer all day, ticking boxes in the job he loathed, dispatching tasteless framed cartoons to people he detested for buying them, and then going home to a woman who looked more like the bulls in the cartoons every day. He sought out diversions on his computer and began by visiting porn sites. Soon he started advertising himself under various false names on internet contact sites. That was what Joy found when she peeked into the contents of his laptop one day when he'd gone off to play golf. At least that had been his story. He'd not been to any golf club. It was strokes and holes of a very different kind he'd been playing and confronted with the evidence, he'd been forced to fess up. He was full frontal, naked and erect on e shagmates, Naked and erect for everyone in the world but her. And so it was, on their 35th wedding anniversary, they returned to the increasingly dilapidated palazzo on the Grand Canal, each with a very different agenda in their hearts and minds, 
to the ones they'd had on those heady days of the honeymoon and the years that followed. He planned to murder her here in Venice. He planned last year to murder her during a spring weekend break in Berlin and the year before that in Barcelona. Each time he'd bottled out. As a former homicide detective, he knew how to get away with murder. He did, but equally he was aware that few murderers ever succeeded. Murderers made mistakes in the white heat of the moment. All you needed was one tiny mistake, a clothing fibre, a hair, a discarded cigarette butt, a scratch, a footprint, a CCTV camera you hadn't spotted, anything. Certain key words were fixed in his mind from years of grim experience. Motive, body, murder weapon. They were the three things that would catch out a murderer. Without any one of those elements, it became harder. Without all three, near impossible. So all he had to do was find a way to dispose of her body, lose the murder weapon as yet not chosen, and as for motive, well, who was to know he had one? Other than the silly friends Joy gossiped with constantly. The possibilities for murder in Venice were great. Joy could not swim and its vast lagoon presented opportunities for drowning, except it was very shallow. There were plenty of buildings with rickety steps where a person could lose their footing, windows high enough to ensure a fatal fall. It had been years since they'd torn each other's clothes off in his hotel room when they arrived. Instead, today, as usual, Johnny logged on and hunched over his computer. He had a slight headache, which he ignored. Joy ate a bar of chocolate from the minibar, followed by a tin of nuts, then the complimentary biscuits that came with the coffee. Then she had a rest, tired from the journey. When she woke to the sound of Johnny farting, she peered suspiciously over his shoulder to check if he was on one of his porn chat sites. What she had missed while she slept was the emails back and forth between Johnny and his new love, Mandy, a petty divorcee he'd met at the gym where he'd gone to keep his six-pack in shape. He planned to return from Venice, a free man. The Bellinis and their favourite cafe had changed and were no longer made with fresh peach juice or real champagne. Venice now smelled of drains. The restaurant was still fine, but Johnny barely tasted his food. He was so deep in thought and his headache seemed to be worsening. Joy had drunk most of the bottle of white wine and with the Bellini earlier, into which she had slipped a double vodka, seemed quite smashed. They had six more nights here. Once the days had flown by, now he struggled to see how they could even fill tomorrow. With luck, he wouldn't have to. He called the waiter over for the bill, pointing to his wife who was half asleep and apologising that she was drunk. It could be important that the waiter remembered this. Yes, poor lady, so drunk, her husband struggled to help her out. They staggered along a narrow street and crossed the bridge that arced over a narrow canal. Somewhere in the dark distance, a gondolier was singing a serenade. You haven't taken me on a gondola in years, she chided, slurring her words. Well, I haven't felt your aura much in years either, she teased. Maybe, maybe I could feel it tonight. I'd rather have my gallbladder removed without an anaesthetic, he thought. But I suppose you can't get it up these days, can you? She taunted. You don't really have an oar anymore, do you? All you have is a dead little mouse that leaks. The splash of an oar became louder. So did the singing. The gondola was sliding by beneath them. In it, entwined in each other's arms, were a young man and a young woman clearly in love as they had once been themselves. As he was now, with Mandy Brent. He stared down at the inky water. Two ghosts stared back then only one. It took Joy some moments to realise anything was wrong. Then she turned, drunk and panicked, screaming for help, for a doctor, for an ambulance. A kindly neurosurgeon told her some hours later in broken English there was nothing anyone could have done. Her husband had been felled by a massive cerebral aneurysm. He would have been dead within seconds. Back in England after Johnny's body had been repatriated, Joy's troubles really started. The solicitor informed her he'd only left half of his entire estate, which was basically the house they lived in, to a woman she'd never heard of. The next thing she knew, the woman was on the phone wanting to discuss the funeral arrangements. I'm having him cremated, Joy said. He told me he wanted to be buried, Mandy Brent insisted. 
I'd like that. I'd like to have somewhere I can go and sit with him. All the more reason, Joy thought, to have him cremated. But there was another bigger reason she'd been thinking of. Much bigger. The following year, on what would have been their, 60, their 36th wedding anniversary, Joy returned to Venice to the same room in the dilapidated former palazzo. She unpacked from her suitcase the small grey plastic urn and put it on the windowsill. She stared at it, then at the view of the Grand Canal beyond. Remember what we said to each other, Johnny, do you? That promise we made to each other about coming back here? Well, I'm helping us to keep that promise. The next morning, she took a water taxi across to Murano. She spoke to the same courteous, courteous assistant in the glass factory, Valerio Barbero, who had helped them every year since they'd first started coming. Signor Barbero was an old man now, stooped and close to retirement. He told Joy how very deeply sympathetic he was, how sad, what a fine gentleman Signor Jones had been. And, as if this was quite a normal thing for him, he accepted the contents of the package and her design without even the tiniest flicker of his roomy eyes. It will be ready in three days, he assured her. It was. Joy could barely contain her excitement on the water taxi back to the mainland. She stopped in St Mark's Square to gulp down two Bellinis in rapid succession to get her in the mood, she decided. Then she entered the hotel room, hung the do not disturb sign on the door and locked it from the inside. She untied the pretty blue box around the tall, sorry, she untied the pretty blue bow around the tall box and carefully opened it, removing the two contents. The first item was the plaster of Paris mould she had taken of Johnny's rude bits all those years ago when he'd been particularly drunk and even more aroused than normal. The second was the exquisite glass replica now filled with the grey powder from the urn. Slowly, feeling pleasantly tipsy from the Bellinis, she undressed and lay on her back on the bed. Remember, Johnny, she whispered, remember that promise we made each other that very first time we came here about coming back and making love here in this room every year forever. You were worried, weren't you, about not being able to get stiff enough for me after you were dead? Well, you really shouldn't have concerned yourself, should you? She caressed the long, slender glass, hard as a rock, stiff as a gondolier's oar, just like she remembered him. The art gallery in this story is real, or at least it was about 20 years ago. I discovered it when I was exploring a town that I'd just moved into in the English Peak District. I didn't go in, though perhaps something came out of it and found me, or at least my imagination. The gallery owner is real too. I found him in a second-hand bookshop in Manchester. Like any artist, I'm grateful for inspiration wherever it comes from. It was after his third unsuccessful job interview that month that Brannigan found the gallery. He wasn't at all familiar with the town. He'd taken more than an hour's bus journey into the countryside to get here, and the interview had taken much less time than he'd expected. Even if he'd wanted to head straight back home, there wasn't another direct bus for well over an hour, and besides which he would rather wait until his wife, Madeline, was there to give him some kind of comfort. No, 
If he couldn't find something to pass the time, then he really was as useless as he was starting to fear he might be. Beyond the shops that lined the main road, hills rose dramatically towards a sky that seemed to be lowering itself to brush them with greyness. Narrow terraces of cottages led halfway up the hills and stopped there, as though exhausted by the climb. After climbing one only to find himself becoming entangled in a maze of dour-looking cramped cottages, even the view was cut off from him, and he doubted whether there could be anything worthwhile in the streets when he found it or it found him. He saw the sign first, hand-painted, old and flaking. Gallery, it announced modestly. As he walked nearer, his first thought was that the attraction had been removed from the street. On either side of the sign were long abandoned shops, the size and shape of the houses he had been walking past. Beneath the sign was simply a hole in the terrace as though the first story of a building had been excised like a tumour. On closer inspection, it became clear that the sign was leading him down an alleyway. Cobbles slick with rainwater and ooze less clearly identified led into what looked like a communal backyard for the empty buildings, open only to the bleak grey sky above. Something moved, clattering from a mound of fallen bricks, a cat blacker and thinner than its own shadow. It turned its one yellow eye towards him before bounding onto the wall above and disappearing into the rooftops. He moved slowly down the alleyway, noticing a repetition of a gallery sign above a doorway halfway along. The door looked as unused as anything else in this part of town. The paintwork had faded like a memory, the handle had rusted, and the single pane of glass set into the wood was cracked and repaired with tape. That was that then, and he turned to leave, somewhat disappointed and yet somehow relieved. But before he'd taken another step, he heard a furtive scrabbling from behind the door, and a light came on, barely illuminating the murky glass. So there was somebody in the gallery, and that could only mean it was open. At least now, he would have some better way to waste his time than threading his way deeper into a maze of increasingly desolate streets. He grabbed hold of a door handle, a sensation that was unpleasantly less solid than it ought to have been, and opened the door, stepping into the gallery. At first, there was only darkness, then a smell so musty and overpowering that it was like being buried. Had his eyes tricked him into believing there was light in the building? Even the daylight was too weak to follow him across the threshold. Brannigan caught his breath, both the smell and his unease held him immobile, but then the light bulb above his head flickered and afforded him a glimpse of a starved and hungry-looking creature that was waiting for him, arms without hands raised above its head. He stepped back, unwilling to be left in the dark with such a vision, but the door had already swung shut behind him and his reaching hands found nothing to grasp. The light flickered again, but this time it stayed on and he found himself staring at a wasted looking man who of course could not have been waiting in the dark for him. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Brannigan spluttered, caught between trying to flee and not wanting to turn his back on that hungry expression. I, I, I have thought, that is, y you are open, aren't you? The gallery owner, if that's what he was, let a grin spread across his face. A grin so wide and so slow that Brennigan thought it might not end until it reached either side of his head. His teeth were long, thin and discoloured. A silver fuzz of beard lined his gaunt face. His skull was otherwise hairless and dark-skinned. Though he looked old and his stooped posture was that of someone twisted by age, his face was unlined, unnaturally smooth. Deep-set eyes stared out at him, small and round and yellowed. My visions are waiting for you, the man replied, though almost as soon as he'd spoken, Brannigan was dismayed to find that he could not remember the sound of his voice. The room in which they stood was small, a rudimentary hallway composed as much of dust 
as of damp looking plaster. A corridor led into what must be the main part of the gallery. Beside this was a small table that served as a counter and a stool that he thought the gallery owner was wiser not to risk perching on. He noticed that the man's hands were unnaturally smooth, totally unlined like his face, and yet there was something even stranger about them. They were pink and the fingers joined together and slightly curved into a permanent cupped position. With unease, he realised that the man's hands were plastic. He stumbled forwards, embarrassed and feeling like a spotlight had been turned on him. Of course, he needn't feel this way. He'd hardly been staring, but all the same, he reached into his overcoat pocket and blurted out, How much? However much you think this may be worth to you, was the only reply. He must mean that the gallery relied on voluntary donations, though heaven knew how that would help when Brannigan could not imagine it ever being less empty than it was now. Not sure whether this ought to make him pay more or less than he might otherwise have done, he fished out whatever loose change the bus ride had left him with, not very much, he had to admit, and held it towards the gallery owner, but the other man just raised his plastic hands out of reach and said, Please leave your donation in the basket. Brennigan did so, dropping the coins into an otherwise empty basket on the tabletop, wondering if he was to be judged on his charity, but the other man's eyes never left his own. Now let's see what I can give to you, he said, as he stepped back out of the way. If nothing else, the rest of the gallery would provide a respite from a strange character's company, and Brennigan was determined not to feel rushed. He stepped into the stubby corridor that led from the foyer. Darkness made it seem much smaller than it surely was. But each of the four rooms that seemed to open onto it, two doorways on either side, revealed light, and he hurried into the nearest as eager as a moth to a flame. This room was windowless, like the foyer, and only a little larger. Another door led on into the next room. The plaster was similarly unpainted, or painted in white, which had dirtied over time. The light bulb was too dim and coated in dust for him to be certain. Really, what kind of place was this in which to enjoy art? He chuckled softly to himself, imagining the tale he would have to tell Madeleine that evening. On each wall hung a single framed piece of artwork. He stepped forward to appraise the first. A photograph, hardly art at all, a very old and very faded portrait of a man and a woman, formally dressed and holding a baby between them. Was there something more that he was supposed to be seeing, or did the gallery owner have some personal reason for hanging this piece here? Was it his family portrait? With a shrug, Brannigan moved on to the next. Immediately he was uncertain whether this was better or worse than the last piece. It looked no more than the daubings of a child, or at least an attempt to recreate the perspective of one. As the viewer, he was staring up into a world that was the familiar grown larger and more threatening. Towering figures on, either, on the edges of a painting seemed to lean towards him, full of warning, but he really wasn't interested and moved on to the last two pictures in the room. Here was a dog. Abstractly done, but still recognisable as such. It was either sleeping in a flower bed or dead and commemorated with wreaths. The next was somewhat better. A bleak and lonely seascape. A small spit of shingle, empty except for a childlike figure staring out at crashing waves beneath a brooding sky. There was a title beneath this one, though he had to squint to be able to read it strip of paper cut from a lined pad and the words printed in ink. I learn I am alone. Brennigan stepped back to look at the painting again. He both liked and disliked it at once. Undoubtedly it was well wrought, but the atmosphere of solitude it conjured was unnerving. At least it had moved him, which he supposed was what art was meant to do, but he still hoped for better as he stepped through into the next room. This was similar to the previous one, except for a window that was blocked up from the outside, 
and the other doorway in here must lead him back out into the main corridor. He'd find out soon enough because the light in here was flickering too. The plasterwork seemed to shift, creating the unwelcome impression that the room was falling down around him. At least the walls held more art this time, two or three pieces on each, ranging from something a little larger than a postage stamp to a canvas so large he wondered how long the crumbling wall would hold it. The first that Brannigan came to appeared purely black. No doubt the light here didn't help with whatever subtleties the painting might conceal. He craned forward and then jerked back with a gasp, for as the light had flickered dramatically behind him, a pair of claw-like hands had reached for his head from the murky depths. An unfortunate optical illusion, of course, for now that the bulb had fallen back into simply sputtering dimly, he could no longer distinguish anything so obvious in the dark palette the artist had used, where the larger part of him would have been reassured to. He stepped further away from the wall. Every corner of a room was lost in shadow. Truly, this was no kind of environment to linger in. He wondered at the mindset of anyone who would. Even if that meant no one but the gallery owner, then that was still one mind he would want no part of. Perhaps thinking about the man had roused him, for here he came stumbling through the gallery. Brannigan could hear him in the room that he'd just left. Unwilling to draw the man's attention, he returned to studying the paintings with an interest that he hoped looked more genuine than it felt. Again, some of them looked as though they'd been produced by a child, or perhaps a mind that had less excuse to be so unformed. Canvases had been no less than attacked by the paint. The red colours were like slashed wounds trying to find a victim to belong to amongst the subjects. Of the subjects themselves, he could make out little, or at least little that made any sense. This one, for example. Only a spider could have so many limbs, but why would it look so terrified by owning them, and would they cause it to be in so much pain? Here was a forest, though, one in which the trees were in various stages of becoming human, or at least creatures resembling human. Though crudely executed, this made the vision of a more unsettling because of a mindless expressions of hatred on the faces. The gallery owner was still in the last room. Indeed, he seemed to be having trouble finding his way out, for the only sign of him was the sound of slapping on the walls. Brannigan pictured him stumbling through the gloom, plastic hands scraping at the walls and he hurried through the doorway to put further distance between them. Something was wrong. This doorway should have led him back into the main corridor of the building, but instead he was in the smallest and worst-lit room yet. If they carried on like this, he'd end up in a coffin. What a thought to have! He tried to ignore it and looked for the exit. He'd had enough of this kind of culture for one day, for a, a lifetime in fact, but he didn't want to head back towards the gallery owner, stumbling and scraping in the shadows. It struck him then. Was it not likely that the man was the artist responsible for all this work? If so, then that was even more of a reason not to be left in the dark with him. There had to be something wrong with a mind that could produce such nightmares. He couldn't believe such things were being paraded as art. Though Brannigan was no lover of art, he thought the very least it would need to be was skillful or even pleasant to look at. These strange works were neither. Misty grey blurs rose from the depths of the canvases, too formless to be called figures, even if some of them appeared to be arranging faces on whatever they had in place of heads. He turned away. The light was so poor that he was having trouble distinguishing the edges of canvases. The shapes seemed to be rising out of the very walls, swimming in the shadows. On the next wall he saw rains of fire, a child eating its own eyes as it crawled from its mother's womb. Lovers turned to ice as they fucked, and children that should have been dead, judging by how burned they looked, attacked adults. 
Here was something that had once been a man, buried alive in a space that barely gave it room to scream. Dogs turned on men, men turned on dogs, and those barely formed faces were everywhere he looked, expressions of undistilled hatred or terror, crudely yet effectively realized. When the pitiful voice cried out, Brannigan could almost believe that he'd become lost in the nightmare world that the paintings were windows onto. And then he remembered the gallery owner stumbling clumsily through the darkened rooms. Though part of him was saying he should investigate, or at least call out to offer help if it were needed, he wanted only to be out of here now and catching his bus ride home, to familiar surroundings and to his wife. He looked again for another way out, trying not to notice any more of the horrendous images that grew like rot in this building. More than ever now, he believed they were the work of one man. The style of them, if such a word could be used, was gruesomely similar. Such a person needed help, all right, but not the kind that he could provide. And then he remembered the man's immobile plastic hands and he felt very cold inside. There was another door, though so small it was barely that. Nevertheless, he thrust himself through it, a narrow gap in the wall. He was reminded of a screaming creature buried alive. Already the seeds of the pictures were sown and the nightmares were growing in his brain. He no longer knew where he was. The last of the four rooms or back into the corridor at last. But as long as he kept moving, he could find a way out of here. He must try not to panic. Easier said than done. He found himself in the smallest and darkest room yet. Indeed, this was lit only by the dim, unsteady glow cast through the narrow doorway behind him. Because what hung from the ceiling in this room was not a light bulb. And whatever was coming towards him through the rooms, pounding at the walls and crying out in frustrated hunger, was not the gallery owner, the artist of the nightmares. It could not be him, for the man had hanged himself from the exposed rafters of this room. Brannigan became aware then of several things all at once. Things which he knew were important, but then his conscious mind dare not think about until he was gone from here. As his eyes darted about to look for means of escape in this final room that offered no other doorway, he allowed himself to become distracted, however briefly, by only one more thing. A final frame hung in the gallery, and he stepped towards it, needing to see what remained to be seen. It took him some moments to realise that what he was looking at was a mirror, for the face that stared back at him looked every bit as unnatural and haunted as everything else he'd seen in this awful place. It was his eyes, most of all, he realised, as he pushed himself away from the flaking wall, unwilling to believe that his reflection was not following quite as quickly as it should. There had been something wrong with his eyes. The eyes had not been his. He fell against the next wall and it sagged under his weight. Was the gallery coming to some kind of life? No, the wall was soft with mould. It looked bruised with it and now he had a means of escape. He began punching and kicking at the plaster. Whatever it was back there, it bellowed again in rage, an angry and formless sound seemingly torn from a soul that had known only pain. But Brannigan was past distraction. He had knocked a hole in the plaster and was tearing at the wall, flinging aside handfuls of material that felt pulpy as diseased flesh. The artist had been driven mad by his visions. That had to explain his taking his own life. But Brannigan couldn't help think that his art was more than just a means of trying to exercise his nightmares. Indeed, could it be a way of passing them on? The hole in the wall was big enough to struggle through now, and he did so, pushing aside more of it as he urged himself onwards. It took a while to recognise the room in which he emerged, for though he had thought it scarcely possible, it seemed even more aged and neglected than when he'd entered the gallery. 
over the table. The man's chair, the basket with Brannigan's coins as dull as unearthed antiquities. There was the door to the alleyway. The last of the afternoon light lay beyond it, and he drove himself towards it. As his hands grasped at the latch, he found the temptation to look back over his shoulder unbearable. As he'd been making his way through the gallery, he found it strange that he hadn't at any time cut across the corridor that dissected the building, and indeed, looking back now, he could see no sign of anything but bare, decaying wall, apart from the hole he'd fought his way through. But even worse than that, and the lingering question of whether or not the artist had removed his own hands to prevent any more of his nightmares finding form, was what was staring at him through that hole, eyes afire with some kind of triumph. He didn't believe in ghosts, Brannigan thought as he turned away and struggled to open the door with hands that felt as useless as lumps of plastic. But even if he had, he couldn't imagine what kind of afterlife could leave one so physically twisted and altered. As it opened what had become of its mouth to roar its newfound agony, he managed to open the door and tumble out into the cobbled alleyway. It was dark out here. So much darker than it ought to be. There mustn't be something wrong with his eyes. He remembered what he thought he'd seen in the reflection back there, but now that he was out of the gallery, he had to be free of whatever atmosphere and influence it had. He rubbed at his eyes, perhaps he was just tired, perhaps he'd grown accustomed to the gloom, and staggered down the alleyway towards the street whilst he could still see. He couldn't lose his sight. That was a ridiculous idea, no less nightmarish than anything he had experienced in the gallery. The idea of simply never being able to see again was bad enough, but it didn't bear thinking about what he would be trapped in that darkness with. Perhaps he could hold on to his sight long enough to find his way out of a maze of streets and back down the hill to where his bus would be waiting. Beyond that, there was home and his wife. As reassuring as those thoughts should have been to him, he couldn't help but wonder just how long he'd be able to live with the nightmares of a madman in his mind. Hi, I'm Helen Grant. Uh, I live in Scotland and I write gothic novels and short supernatural fiction. My last book was called Too Near the Dead and I have a new novel out this autumn. It's called Jump Cut and it's about a notorious lost film. The story I'm going to read is called All Things That Are Reproved. It's from Songs of the Northern Seas by Igaeus Press, um, December 2021 a limited edition hardback with beautiful illustrations. It feels um, very much like an antiquarian book. The brief for the book was a collection of weird or uncategorizable tales of a Nordic or more generally Arctic flavour. Tales of icy winds, frozen harbours, ancient pine forests, the aurora borealis, trading ships, nomadic people, month-long nights, etc, etc. Geographically, the stories can take place anywhere or within view of the Arctic Circle. I decided to set my story in Shetland, which was probably stretching within view of the Arctic Circle a bit, but it's the northernmost part of Britain and the nearest to the Arctic Circle. 
I visited Shetland in 2015 because I won the Jimmy Paris Award for my short crime story, The Beach House, and that was awarded at the Shetland Noir Book Festival. I have a great friend who lives there and she very kindly drove me all over Shetland so that I could see as much of it as possible in the couple of days I was there. And she also advised me on some of the details of the story, um, such as the naming of Jeemsy. So thank you, Cathy. Um, the title comes from a biblical quotation. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Ephesians 5.13, um, the King James Version. And the next bit runs, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. All things that are reproved. Tom Buchanan handed over his gold card with a very bad grace. The car hire attendant glanced at him. The usual question, holiday is it, was hovering on his lips, but he swallowed it, fearing an explosion. Instead, he concentrated on finishing the paperwork as quickly as possible and handed over the keys. Tom took them and stalked out without another word. All the way to the ferry terminal, he fumed. The unnecessary expense. The whole project was far enough in the red at this point without adding a car hire bill. He understood that phone reception was terrible on the island, which was why they had prearranged this particular day and time, and she hadn't been at the airport to meet him. He wasn't worried. He didn't imagine Ailey having fallen off a ladder and smacked her head on something, or driven off the single track road into a bog. No, she would be there in the cottage with a paintbrush in her hand, and when he turned up she would say, Oh God, was it today, Tom? in that distracted way that drove him nearly up the wall. How had he ended up with someone so disorganised? The first ferry journey was short. Then he had an 18-mile drive to the next one, chewing his lip and scowling at the road. He took no notice of the bleakly beautiful landscape, instead hugging his ire to himself. After the second ferry, it was perhaps 14 miles to get to the cottage, if you allowed for all the bends in the road. There was no danger of him and Ailey crossing each other without noticing. There was only the one route. Clearly, she had not even started out. There was no sign of the weathered Suzuki, or indeed any other car. When he pulled up outside the cottage, the sun was low in the sky. He parked beside the Suzuki and got out. It was raining. Tom saw at once that the front door was open and felt another flare of irritation. The water would be slanting in, soaking the floor and the coats hanging just inside the door. He thought about his luggage, then decided to leave it for now. Get inside and get something hot to drink. That was all he wanted to do. The gravel crunched under his feet and then he ducked his head slightly and went in. Ailey? No reply. Though the place was small enough that she must have heard him, you couldn't really get out of earshot. There were lights on and a faint, damp smell in the air, something minerally like wet stone. Not bothering to be polite, he went to the bathroom intending to bang on the door, whatever she was doing, but there was no need. It stood open, and he could see there was no one inside. He heard a single dripping sound that was somehow too resonant for an empty tub. When he leaned in and looked, he saw that the bath was full of water. Tom went in and put his hand into it. It was cold. He became aware, too, that the air was very cool. The house felt empty. His annoyance was draining away fast. He went from room to room, calling her name, but Ailey was in none of them. Had she gone out the back? The cold bath water made him very uneasy, but he clung to the obvious explanations. Ailey was not only disorganised but impulsive. She might very well have seen some interesting bird or animal and gone outside to look at it. But when he went around the house to look, the land stretched away to the cliffs with not a single human figure in view. The wind plucked at the rough grass, and in the distance he saw a sheep grazing, but there was no sign anywhere of Ailey. Tom thought about the cold bath. The water had been clean. She hadn't been in it. The lights were all on. 
These things were suggestive of the idea that she had been interrupted the night before, after putting on the lamps against the dark and running herself a bath. But where had she gone? For a moment he wondered whether he had imagined the Suzuki standing outside, because he had expected to see it. Perhaps she had gone off in it. But when he rounded the house again, there it was, parked next to his hire car. He went over and placed a hand on the bonnet, and it was cold. The engine hadn't run recently. He stood there for a moment, the wind blasting the side of his face. Then he decided to call the police. There was no landline at the cottage, and when he tried his mobile, not very optimistically, he couldn't get any reception. So he got back into the hire car and drove south, retracing his earlier journey, but this time fueled by fear instead of anger. There were no police on the island and only a single constable on the next one. Eventually police came from the only burg on the islands and later the Coast Guard joined the search. There was no sign of Ailey anywhere on the open land around the cottage and no sign of a struggle inside it. The conclusion seemed to be that she had gone over the cliffs into the Atlantic. But why would she do that, said Tom, haggard-faced, tired and dehydrated, still in the same clothes he had travelled in. The men shook their heads. They couldn't say. The weather was worsening and night had come in. The search would have to be continued at first light. Standing outside the cottage, Tom could hear the sea pounding at the cliffs, the spray thrown high up into the air. He thought he could feel salt droplets on his face. Anyone, anything in that churning maelstrom would be dashed to pieces on the rocks. He turned his thoughts away from that, trying to think of other explanations for her disappearance, happier ones. After a while he went into the bathroom and let the cold water out of the bath. The police hadn't asked him not to, so he did it and ran himself a hot bath instead. Then he got into the steaming water with a book he couldn't concentrate on and a glass of whisky. He left the door open and he'd left the front door ajar, propped with a large stone, thinking to hear Rayleigh if she came back. Closing and locking it seemed unpleasantly final, and besides, nobody was going to burgle the place out here. She had to come back, he thought. The cottage was a joint plan, something they had been going to do together. His job had longer hours, more stress, but more money, so she was the one who was going to manage the bookings. She had been the one carrying on with the painting, the cleaning, the small jobs, while he was at his office in Edinburgh. He couldn't think how it would work without her. He wasn't going to have to work without her because she was going to come back, he said to himself. She had to. His thoughts went around and around, always returning to the same place like a worn-out dog at the end of a chain. They had the whole thing planned out. The cottage at the end of the world, that was going to be their angle. He supposed it wasn't quite the end, because there were two more tiny islands north of this one, but since the lighthouse had become automated, there was no one living on that one, and the other was nothing but a lump of rock sticking out of the sea. Effectively, you were as close to the Arctic Circle as you could possibly be while still in Britain. It was further north even than the property shown on internet searches as the northernmost dwelling place. That, he supposed, was because it had been uninhabited for years. The thick, whitewashed stone walls had been solid enough, but they re had replaced nearly everything else, the timbers and floorboards, the corroded pipes, the rotting window frames. They'd rewired the house and put in a new septic tank and solar panels on the new roof. It had taken longer than expected because a lot of the work had had to be done by men coming from the other islands, and they'd never been prepared to stay late, presumably because of the ferries. Tom took a mouthful of whisky, remembering. The workmen had been a fickle lot, unpredictable. There had been days and even a week once when he hadn't been able to get them to come. He and Ailey had carried on with the jobs they could tackle themselves, but sometimes they had just driven back to the place they were renting while the work was done and spent the evening watching the northern lights and drinking wine. After this had happened a few times, Ailey had developed an implausible theory that the men wouldn't come on nights when the lights were visible. Slightly inebriated, she had held up her glass towards the shifting greenish glow. They're moonlighting, she had declared, taking tourists to see the northern lights. Probably pays better than putting floors down and plastering walls. 
I should think the tourists can go and see the lights by themselves, Tom had suggested. Amy had shaken her head a little too emphatically. It's the only explanation. It wasn't the only explanation as it happened, but Tom had decided to keep the other one to himself. Amy could be impressionable at times, and he could see her turning down a perfectly good business opportunity because she decided the place had bad vibes. He nearly hadn't heard it at all. The agent who had sold them the place had been an older man from two islands away, a grey-haired man with a seamed face and a beer belly who held an unlit cigarette between his fingers the entire time they were going over the property, dying to light it as soon as Tom and Amy had gone. He hadn't had much to say about the cottage, Considering he was an estate agent, he hadn't seemed to care whether he sold it to them or not. Sometimes during the visit, he simply stood and gazed stolidly out to sea as though thinking about something else entirely. No, if he knew anything about the cottage, he wasn't telling. Tom had had the story from a local woman. He'd met her one of the very first times they'd visited the island while they were still planning all the work. He'd gone out in the Suzuki, swerved for a sheep, and driven into the ditch. There was a cottage nearby, so he'd gone to ask for help, and the woman had told him her husband would be back in half an hour with the tractor. They could pull it out then. She'd invited him in for a cup of tea, and he should have known from the avid look in her eye that she was curious about him. She was a plump woman with short, practical hair and a forthright expression. You're buying Blind James's place then, she said. I don't think so. You are, she said, leaning back against the stove with an assessing look. The house to the north, the furthest one. He shrugged. Don't think anyone's lived in it for ages. It's still blind Jeems's place. He wasn't inclined to argue. Well, if you say so. She picked up a packet of cigarettes, fumbled one out and began to hunt for her lighter. I'm not from here, she said. Not originally. Tom said nothing. He'd worked that out from her accent. She glanced at him. Nobody who's from here, who was born here, will tell you about that place. They don't talk about it. But I think someone should. She lit the cigarette and exhaled smoke. It's not right not to tell you. Tell us what? Fleetingly, Tom imagined some planning issue or some known subsidence. But they'd checked all that. None of us would live there at Jeems's place. Oh? He eyed her. Why is that? He thought she might come out with some over-the-top story, something about old Jeemsy being found dead in particularly gruesome circumstances, a tale designed to put the wind up outsiders. Instead, she said, they don't want to see. See? See what? She just looked at him for a long time and eventually Tom said, are you winding me up? She shook her head. No, I wouldn't. But there must be lots of places you could buy instead of that one. Better places, south of there. Better outlook. We like that one, said Tom. And anyway, that's our USP. Unique selling proposition, he added helpfully. The cottage at the end of the world. If we bought one in the south of the island, it wouldn't be at the end, would it? No, but do people really want that? To be at the end of the world? She snorted. I wouldn't. Why not? She didn't answer that. She said, you have your wife with you, don't you? She... Tom was about to say that Ailey wasn't actually his wife, but it occurred to him that the islanders might be traditionally minded. He didn't know them well enough to say. At any rate, he didn't want to offend anyone's sensibilities, so he changed it to, yes, I do. You shouldn't leave her there, not on her own. She looked down, not catching his eye. Tom began to feel really irritated. This was both doom-laden and evasive. He wondered whether he should leave, but that Suzuki wasn't going to climb out of the ditch on its own. He folded his arms and said, Come on, just tell me what's the matter with Jeems's house. You can't half tell me like that. It's not a safe place, she said at last. Jeemsy built that house. There was nothing there before, never had been. I never met him myself, moved here too late, but they say he liked his solitude. It tickled him to think he was further north than anyone else except the lighthouse keeper. She blew out more smoke. The lighthouse keepers, they were never bothered by anything. I can't say why. Perhaps it was because of the light. 
You wouldn't see things the same, not with that great lamp blazing out above you. Anyway, Jimsy built that place and moved in with his wife. Oh yes, he had a wife at the start. For a while it was fine. Certain times of years, you're not likely to see it. You mean the northern lights? interrupted Tom. She shook her head. Lights, no. They say you're more likely to see this thing when the lights are visible, but it's not the same. It's something else. It's not Mariel either, though you're more likely to see that at the same time too. Tom had heard of Mariel. It was a kind of bioluminescence in the sea. The corner of his mouth tightened cynically, but he let her go on. There was nothing else to do until her husband came back with the tractor. They say it's blue and silver, not pink or green like the lights often are, and it comes from the north, from the Arctic. It drifts over the sea like a frost or a har. It doesn't come often, perhaps one day in 600, sometimes in a cluster, two, three days. But when it comes, there's no mistaking it. Well, that sounds quite pretty, said Tom with deliberate heartiness. I'd like to see that. The woman stared. No, you wouldn't. Another drag on the cigarette. You can hear it too. A beautiful sound, the most beautiful you've ever heard. Like mermaids singing. And in the blue and silver light you can see them. All the people who've seen it and heard it before. All the lost ones. Lost ones? The ones who went into it and never came back. Tom considered. Well, he said finally, if they never came back, how does anyone know what it sounds like? Blind Jimsy knew it, she said, but he couldn't see it. One night he came home late and it had come while he was away. The door of the cottage stood open and his wife was gone. Her gaze shifted away. They say he never loved anyone but her. After that he stayed there until he was old, listening for it. He loved the sound of it. He thought he could hear his wife's voice running through that strange music, or whatever it was. Lucky he was blind then, remarked Tom. Not lucky, she said quietly. He put his own eyes out. This was too much. Tom had put down his cup of tea, intending to walk out. He'd walk home if he had to, and sought out recovery later. But at that moment the woman's husband had come in and the conversation had ended. The man had agreed to haul the Suzuki out of the ditch, so they had gone outside. All their talk was about the vehicle. The woman didn't come out of the house to say goodbye, and he had not seen her since. He had never run into her at the store or the petrol station. It had crossed his mind briefly that the story of Blind Jeansy might be an additional selling point for the cottage. He could get a little booklet made up for visitors. But on reflection he decided that was a bad idea. The bit about the guy putting his own eyes out was too unpleasant. A lot of people would be put off by it, and the ones who weren't... He imagined goth girls in fishnets and fingerless gloves, and geeky paranormal researchers. No, he was looking for a different kind of clientele altogether. And of course he'd have had to tell Ailey the story, and heaven knew what she would have made of it. The bathwater was getting cold, and the whisky was all gone. Tom stood up and reached for a towel. In the silence, he heard a single drop of water falling into the bath. Where are you, Ailey? he thought. He went into their bedroom and after a little deliberation, he got dressed again in more practical waterproof clothes. He could not imagine coolly locking up and going to bed, not if Ailey might be outside the house somewhere. If things turned out for the worse, and his mind carefully steered around the thought of what the worst might be, he didn't want to look back and think that he had laid his head down on the Egyptian cotton pillow slip and slept the sleep of the innocent while outside in the freezing dark. He put on heavy boots and took a wax jacket with a hood off one of the pegs in the hallway. Then he went outside into the night and the yellow light from the open door bled out after him into the darkness. Ailey! he shouted. Ailey! Ailey! A gust of wind dinned his ears and thin rain spattered his face. He trudged about in the rough grass, feeling very little optimism. There were no trees she could be hidden behind. There were hollows and undulations in the ground, but with only faint moonlight and the feeble light of a torch to see by, he'd have had to get right into each of them and feel about with his hands, to be sure. Tom decided that he would search until he was too tired or too cold to continue, and then he would try to rest until first light. 
There was no danger of going over the cliff edge himself. He could hear the sea very clearly. He stood for a moment and listened, turning his face towards it. The crashing and seething of the waves was tremendous, but he thought his ears detected another sound through it, like a single silver thread in a vast tapestry, a not unpleasing sound, as still and pure as the top note produced by an accomplished singer. Some trick of the sea, Tom thought. He wondered whether that was what blind Jeansy had heard. It would be easy to imagine it was a voice, though it was certainly something else. The cry of a seabird, the howl of the wind through a hole in the rocks, or perhaps even the product of his own auditory nerves. Now that he stood facing the sea, he realised that he could see the cliff edge. Beyond them, far to the north, the shifting, streaming illumination of the northern lights was beginning to be visible. It throbbed like green fire, the upper parts of the flames blurring to deep pink. It was stunning, no doubt about that, no matter how many times he saw it. He and Ailey had pictured visitors to the cottage, watching it with a glass of wine in their hands, congratulating themselves on finding a location that offered these natural fireworks. The lights flared upwards like gas jets, fell back, flared up again, suffusing the whole sky with their green glow. The subtle shifts in colour were mesmerising. In spite of himself, Tom stared, feeling himself diminished to respect by their vast brilliance. Green, pink, green, and then blue. The change was subtle at first, seeping slowly up the sky like a stain. Green blurred into turquoise and then into a shade of blue that was nearly mauve. Green again, and then blue once more, fading into a pale radiance that was almost silvery. Tom stared open-mouthed. Then he said to himself, These are natural colours. That woman was spinning me a story. But he didn't turn away. He gazed up into the sky, and as he watched the colours pulse, from silver to blue to green and then black to blue again, that sound once again filled his ears. It was thin, needle-sharp, exquisite. He couldn't have described it to anyone. It was a voice, it was music, it was an exquisite agony and joy that pierced him. The sky throbbed blue again, and this time it did not return to green. That unearthly silver swept over everything like the beat of a mighty wing, lighting up the cliffs and the cottage and the sea so brilliantly that for a moment his eyes hurt. Adjusting. Tom went towards the cliff edge, stepping over tufts of silvered grass. When the lights went blue, he stopped, unable to see his way. When they fled silver, he walked on. Over the wind, the formless voices of angels sounded in his ears. When he came to the edge of the cliff, he would have known it even with his eyes shut. Mingled with the faint dappling of rain, he could feel salt spray on his face as gigantic waves roared against the rock. He stood there and looked. He understood why people had compared the phenomenon to a har. Like a wall of mist, it seemed to obscure the distant sea, the vast open waters that led to the Arctic Circle. The colours on his face strode blue and silver as he watched something come gliding silently out of it. It was a square-rigged sailing ship, three-masted, it came on steadily in defiance of the swell and the squalling wind, the bowsprit rising and falling, the great sails pale, almost phosphorescent. A ragged pennant streamed from the tallest mast. It seemed to be taking course directly for the cliffs, the bow cut confidently through the deep water, throwing up white spoon. As it neared, Tom saw that the entire ship glittered. It seemed to be rhymed thickly with ice, which covered every spar and ratlin. He thought that it would be dashed against the rocks, but as it approached it made an impossible turn, shrugging against the sea like a gigantic marine creature, and sailed past him, side on. From the cliffs, Tom should not have been able to see any detail of the vessel, but the strange, brilliant quality of the light seemed to show him everything with crystalline clarity. He saw that something moved upon the decks of the ship. They must be sailors, surely, fighting to keep it to its course. There was nothing else they could be, but they moved raggedly and sparkled with the same deadly frost as the decks and ropes. The great ship slid past him and at last vanished into the darkness, but by then 
Tom was not looking at it any more. That high resonant sound thrilled all about him as he gazed north at the other things coming out of the bluish light. Some things he recognised easily. There was another ship, a far more modern one, without the towering masts, and there were smaller boats, one of them clearly a fishing vessel from its squat shape and landing crane. All encrusted with ice that glittered with diamond coldness, all of them crawling with those tiny figures that jerked and flickered in the freezing radiance. Once he saw something that might have been a coracle, riding the enormous waves that rolled towards the cliffs, its single inhabitant curled inside it like a cockle in its shell. Last came a vessel whose shape he knew only from books. A long, low, wooden ship whose prow reared up into the neck and head of a roaring dragon. Its single sail bellied out in the wind, and at the oars sat the shapes of men whose furs and hair and beards were white with ice, whose faces were purple hollows and shadows, the eye sockets sealed over with frost. Tom understood the sound now. It was a song tormentingly beautiful. He went closer to the cliff edge and looked down. The waves were huge, tremendous. They crashed into the rock with explosive power, throwing up great plumes of white water. As he gazed down, he felt a cold hand slide into his. He turned his head. Ailey stood beside him, brightly illuminated in changing shades of blue and silver. Her clothes, her long hair clung to her, saturated with freezing water. Ice crystals sparkled on her skin. She turned her face to him and he saw that her eyes were vacant, her lips blue. Tom, she said without speaking, the music, it's so beautiful. Yes, said Tom, his hand tightened on hers. Silently, together, they plunged into the sea. I recognized Givens even through the exaggerated lens of the bottom of the shot glass, even after number six, where things looked kind of watery. He was a little guy with that jowly, hangdog, drooling St. Bernard expression that introduced him. I emptied the glass and motioned him into the booth. You're not really supposed to drink at Schwab's, but I was a pretty damn good customer, and if I had my nipper in my pocket, they'd bring on the glass and look the other way. And the way my career was going at the moment, I needed a few shots of liquid courage before facing my esteemed representation. Even if you'd never met him before, you'd peg Givens as an agent on the skids. His suit was noisy, the tie deafening, and the collar a little frayed. I'd have given anything to jump ship back to the Morris office, as if they'd have me at this point. The days were blurring now that glory was hanging in the closet of the past. I'd done that Lancaster picture back in 44 or 45, but, you know, it was the end of the war, and even a lot of good pictures got swept under the rug back then. Bert was a handsome guy and a hell of an athlete, but not what you'd call Academy Award material, not back then. But I got a hell of a performance out of him, and we both got some pretty nice notices in the trades. Of course, he's a movie star now, and I'm, well, I'm having lunch at Schwab's with Bert Givens. I was still doing the studio stuff in the 40s, the glory days, you know, not this independent bullshit. Hollywood is changing and not for the better. If you ask me, this whole antitrust thing is killing the picture business. 
And once Wasserman finagled that piece of the profits for Jimmy Stewart on that cowboy picture. Well, the end is nigh, my friend. The end is nigh. Given sighed in concert with the red Naugahyde booth as he took a seat and signaled the waitress. She saw him and smiled that phony waitress grin, said, Turkey croquettes? And took his nod to the kitchen. I don't know what he saw in those fucking croquettes, but he ordered them every time. They made me gag. They broil up a pretty nice little skirt steak at Schwab's, if you ask for medium rare. But again, one look at Givens, and you'd take him for a turkey croquettes kind of guy, which is no compliment. A little teddy bear grin lifted the corners of his jowls, and I knew right away something was up. I waited, but he stayed clammed up. Please, Bert, I pleaded. Don't make me play, I've got a secret with you. Gary Moore, you ain't. It was still early for lunch, barely noon, but Schwab's was filling up. It never ceased to amaze me how many guys from the business lunched here. Of course, if you were nooning at Schwab's, you weren't working. And if you weren't working, you were looking for work. And maybe Schwab's was not the best place to be so obviously looking for work. The aging, balding, expanding actors were the most pathetic because they were, well, so public. I got a nibble, Given said, barely able to conceal his gnome-like glee. So go to the doctor and get a shot, I said. I didn't mean to be mean, but Jesus, with six belts of VAT-69 simmering through my vascular system, I wasn't going to be Amy Vanderbilt. I'm talking about work. I'll tell you again, I don't do television. All those live cameras going on at the same time, it ain't like directing a picture. Give me one camera at a time, if you please. Givens was ready to hop up on the table like an organ grinder's monkey. He was so excited. It ain't television, he said. It's a picture. A picture, I asked. Which studio? He settled down then. It's not one of the majors, but it's a good picture, Lee. It's independent money, but they say Aldo Ray is interested. Aldo Ray couldn't get a table at Dino's on a Monday night. Aldo Ray couldn't get arrested. Aldo Ray gets them release in England, Germany, and Italy. It's a good picture, Lee, and with you directing it could be a great picture. It's not an offer yet, but if you play your cards right and do a good meet and greet, I think I can make it one. I hadn't done a picture in a couple years. Just that episode where I filled in for John Newland on One Step Beyond when he got sick. And that had gotten some pretty nice notices, too. Not that anybody ever gave me credit, but good notices are good notices. Tell me it's not an odor. It ain't a cowboy picture, Lee. This one's right up your alley. It's a scary movie. Like a Hitchcock? Yeah, just like a Hitchcock, but with a monster. My gut sank, and it wasn't the stake. A monster meant no money, no good stars, no respect. And more likely than not, a shitty little paycheck. And Aldo Ray. What's the name of this little Hitchcockian opus? It's just a working title. They're not married to it. Givens was starting to squirm. Oh boy, this is going to be good. Lay it on me, Bert. Even Givens couldn't say it with a straight face. She Creatures of Moratow Reef. AIP? Allied Artists? It's a new company. Regal, Royal, some fancy pants kind of name. But they got the money in the bank and they got Aldo Ray. And if they play their cards right, they got Lee Benton. I don't know, Bert. A monster picture? I mean, I never heard of these guys. They're new. Just meet with them. And do I have to say you need this picture? There it was. The salt in the wound, the finger in the eye. But he was right. I needed this picture. And if I could put my own stamp on it, who knows? It might lead to something better. And if the script were even remotely interesting. So, Bert, have you read it? I'm halfway through. It's a good read. I nodded, dreaming desperate dreams. And one more thing, another big grin, like this was the icing or something. Thrill me. I knew it wasn't going to be something to celebrate. It's in 3D. Oh, hell, it just kept getting worse. Jesus, Bert, it's the year of our Lord, 1959. For crying out loud, it's going to be a new decade in a few months. Obler made Buona Devil, what, 51, 52? House of Wax was a long time ago. They don't make 3D pictures anymore, and for a good reason. You ever see one of those things? I've still got a headache from that goddamn Rhonda Fleming Inferno thing. Well, Royal or Regal is making this one, and it comes with a paycheck. Somebody's going to direct this picture, and it may as well be Y-O-U. 
I can spell, Bert. Remember, I did a season of Romper Room. And they'd like you back. Thanks, but no thanks. I fucking hate kids. Even my own, but I didn't need to tell him that. And besides, I haven't seen them since they moved to Westwood with their mother and that B-movie actor. I should talk. Here I am, pinning my hopes on a B-picture myself. I sighed and filled my shot glass again, downing it just as my steak was delivered. A good thing. I needed the protein right now. Bert's eyes were wide, patient, expectant. What the fuck? It could be a good picture. God damn it, I could make it a good picture. And what else was I going to do? Keep bullshitting my guild buddies over lunch at Schwab's? Get me the meeting, Bert. The seduction of the innocent has begun. I should have felt good about myself and my future as I stepped out onto sunset under the harsh light of the midday sun. If I played my cards right and kissed the right hiney, I had a movie to shoot. So it wasn't for Universal International or Paramount or Warners. It was a movie, and God knows I needed a movie. It's not just the money, though. Of course, that was part of it. But a man has to have a little self-respect. And with a picture spattered with a handle like She Creatures of Moratow Reef, the self-respect generated was guaranteed to be teensy. Traffic was heavy at the intersection of Sunset and Crescent Heights. Across the street, the Garden of Allah apartments baked, the palms sagging overhead like the old Russian broad that ran the place, who was out in her shmata with a turban wrapped around her collapsing skull, raking the sidewalk. I watched Bert pull away in his little Italian sports car and choked on his fumes. As the cars and buses and trucks rolled by, something in me wanted to step out into their path. Don't you ever feel that way? I mean, I'm not a suicidal kind of guy, but there's some kind of little devil in my brain that just wants to tug me into oncoming traffic. I never really succumb to its pull, but I always feel like I could. I just wanted to step out into the path of that big two-tone caddy with the perky little brunette behind the wheel and be crushed by it. I really wanted to be pinned to the grill of that Chrysler Imperial and dragged down the boulevard. I didn't want to die, but it was hard to keep from stepping into that roaring street. I could actually see the red skid marks in my wake, which shook me from this morbid reverie. I looked up and saw my own reflection in the picture window at Schwab's, and I was shocked by what looked back at me. There was a middle-aged guy there, a spare tire hiding the belt, three days of out-of-work Gabby Hayes chin whiskers, an off-the-rack Robert Hall suit going shiny with age and mileage, and a vacancy behind the eyes like you'd see on one of those guys on a street corner downtown selling pencils. Speaking of self-respect, I vowed then and there to get a haircut and a shave, a new suit, and spend an hour a day with Jack LaLanne. Surprisingly, it was a pretty happy set. Cramped, yes, hot and sweaty in the little East Hollywood Boulevard garage they tried to call a studio, but not unhappy. Aldo Ray turned out to be a pretty decent guy when he wasn't on the sauce. And we even got John Carradine to play the scientist. Yeah, that was a stretch. And got Maura Corday fresh off her Universal International contract for the ingenue. Her husband, Dick Long, said he'd do a bit, but I knew they'd never let him take time off from 77 Sunset Strip to do She Creatures of Moritau Reef. We had an 80 grand budget and a 13-day schedule, so I was feeling pretty good. I mean, compared to what this thing could have been. Of course, the 3D camera was five times the size of what I was used to working with, and the technicians who aligned the lenses were as slow as Cheney II as Lenny, but it was okay. I didn't want to go too far into the cornball with the trip into the third dimension, you know, paddle balls into the lens, shit like that, but I wanted to make it active. I kept trying to think of ways to use the tool rather than exploit it. But hell, with a title like She Creatures of Moritau Reef, perhaps subtlety was not the best artistic choice. What I wanted was to get Mara Corday's tits right up into your face so you felt like you could slide a greedy hand right into her cleavage, but I knew I'd never get past the Hayes office with that one. And, speaking of cleavage, Mara turned out to be a pretty slick little actress. She was game for anything. Hell, she even played second banana to the Black Scorpion, though I fell in love with her last year in Girls on the Loose. Aldo was always trying to pull some of that method shit on her, but I think it was his way of trying to make time with her. She seemed too smart to fall for that baloney. 
I hope she wasn't too smart to fall for mine. Hey, the divorce has been final for eight months now. Mine, not hers. But we could work on that. Well, the Rondell studios were palpitating with the summer heat, as well as Mara and the other she-creatures. We rounded up some models and strippers and put them in the skimpiest little French bikinis that we thought we could get away with. And when they converged on Carradine's lab and got everything wet, well, my temperature sure went up, I can promise you that. The girls all had rubber fins glued to their backs and the backs of their arms, and little rubber gills on their necks that opened and closed with the pull of some fishing line. So, in our little opus, there's a fire breaking out in the lab, and the girls are gasping because they can't breathe out of the water, and Carradine's spouting scientific mumbo-jumbo like it's fucking Henry V, and the air is starting to get pretty thin. Suddenly the flames are reaching high up to the ceiling, well over the top of the set, and the effects guy's face just goes as white as a mayonnaise sandwich. Blaisdell, the monster guy, starts shrieking like a little girl, or like a dying kitten running for the doors. Well, he's pushing when he should be pulling, and everybody's starting to panic as the place fills with smoke. It's a dog pile of fish girls in the little tinderbox stage, and some of them are starting to drop from the heat and the smoke. Carradine actually starts to cry, which didn't help at all. Aldo, well, Aldo didn't seem to notice. He probably thought it was in the script. Again, he's a nice fella, but I don't know if he was all there that day. So it's screaming and sweating and crying and basically just all hell breaking loose. Nobody was doing anything productive, so I just played director and shoved everybody away from the door, heaved against the heavy door plunger, and got the thing open. But that was just a box within the blocks. The whole building, which looked like it had once been an auto repair shop, was filling with roiling clouds of movie smoke, the worst kind if you ask me. So I headed right to the thick glass window, which had been painted black and covered with a layer of asbestos, ripped off the fire retardant and chucked a trash can through the glass. The smoke raced for the gaping hole in the glass like an escaping convict, as clean air, well as clean as Hollywood air gets in 1959, which isn't very tried its best to replace it. As cast and crew made their way off the stage and in onto the shabby eastern end of the boulevard, gasping and choking, I stood hypnotized by the jagged mouth of the glass opening. The shards were like teeth, calling, beckoning me. What would it be like, I wondered, if I had been thrown into that glass? What if I had made an Olympian Weissmuller dive right through the center and one long, jagged tooth slid right down the length of my neck? Would I have even felt it? Or would it have just slid through my flesh like a breath, opening my carotid artery like a whisper? Would it have continued to travel down my torso, gutting me like a halibut, dumping my innards out of their flesh closet like so many dumplings? Would I feel it? Or would it just be a big red secret between me and my body, a crimson river ebbing with my life? I was being stupid and I knew it but the wicked grin of the broken glass would not let me go. I looked down at my arm and saw the faint pulse of the veins beneath the skin. Daylight hit the glass and painted a prismic pattern on my pulse, calling to it. I held my arm over the blade of glass, just wondering. Again, I wasn't going to do anything about it, but what would happen if I did? I wanted to just lower my wrist down onto the window and pull it down and across, gently, almost lovingly. I didn't want to die, but I could not evade the pull of the hungry glass. I brought down my arm and the glass gave it a gentle kiss. It could slice through my skin like a gift. It was so insistent, it wanted me so badly. It's not that I wanted it back, it's just that I felt, hell, I don't know, compelled. The screaming siren that announced the arrival of the fire engines pulled me out of that compulsion and brought me back to the real world. Well, back to Hollywood Boulevard, anyway. I walked away from the shattered window, backwards, watching it recede with its own siren call fading into memory. I joined the crowd on the sidewalk and stated the obvious. I guess that's a wrap on the lab. Carradine was already walking down the boulevard, loudly rehearsing tomorrow's speech to himself. Aldo asked me if I wanted to join him for a drink, but I begged off. I slid over to Mara, who sat on the curb in tears and draped a comforting arm on her shoulder. She looked at me through a lens of tears, and I swear to God they collected a prism of their own when they hit 
just the right angle of the sun, and it sparkled my shirt with bright late afternoon color. Are you okay? I asked her. She sniffed and nodded in the affirmative. Anything I can get you? She just took my hand and cracked a brave little smile. You're sweet, she told me, and I would take that to the bank. I was working up a line of credit. America deserved Mara Corday in full 3D. The producers and the brass at Regal or Royal were in a tizzy. We could do without any more lab footage, and the fire looked pretty spectacular on film, but we lost half a day. There was no choice but to pull pages. There was no way they'd go over the lucky 13 days. It was up to me to make the cuts, and there was some agony in that. You know, the man-woman touchy-kissy stuff is the easiest to shoot in one of these pictures, and it's the stuff that puts the patrons to sleep. Aldo Ray smooching with Mara Corday is only going to be interesting to Aldo Ray, to be honest, especially in 3D. You go to a picture called She Creatures of Moritau Reef. It ain't to see Aldo Ray in a clinch, that's for sure. The big love scene had to go. I was afraid to tell Aldo, but as it turned out, he didn't give shit one. To tell you the truth, I don't think he ever read any of the pages until the night before each day's shoot. He probably didn't even know what the goddamn picture was about. And though Mara acted disappointed, she wasn't so great a thespian that I couldn't see the relief in her eyes. I drove the Edsel, unjustly maligned in my humble opinion, home over Laurel Canyon to the little cottage where I was hanging my hat in Studio City when I decided to clear my head a little with a side trip down Mulholland Drive. Even as evening was falling like a closing night curtain, the temperature still hovered somewhere in the low 90s. I pulled my tie off and threw it over onto my hat in the passenger seat as I drove, seeking beauty anywhere I could find it. I pulled over at a gravel overlook and watched the lights blink on like little eyes through the coffee carpet of smog. In spite of the heat, it was turning into a nice night. The grid between the orange groves was coming gently to life, and it beckoned to me, called me into its heart. The scent of oranges drifted up through the cruddy fumes of internal combustion like fingers, finding me and caressing me. On the radio, Julie London was singing Cry Me a River as the river of Laurel Canyon boulevards sliced through the San Fernando Valley below. It was my own personal drive-in theater. I sat in the Edsel, the engine idling its gassy breath into the night air as Julie kissed my ear and the scent of orange tickled my nostrils. Lights below throbbed like a heartbeat. This vast silver screen beyond was calling out to me. I wanted to dive into its heart. I dropped the transmission into gear and inched the front tires right to the precipice. The Edsel shivered as it stood at the brink, idling in drive. My right foot suddenly weighed a hundred pounds, and it was sheer will that kept it from dropping to the floor on the accelerator. I put my left foot on the brake, and my weighty right foot goosed the engine a little. The Edsel wanted to roar. It wanted to take its 300 horsepower and launch into space as I rode it straight down into the middle of Ventura Boulevard below. Only that damned left foot kept it from charging ahead, and it was getting tired. It wanted to fall to the floorboard and relax while Mr. Rightfoot wanted to slam to the floor. I lifted the gear shift into park just as Wright won the war. As my foot dropped to the floor, the engine bellowed like a hungry beast, but the Edsel remained trembling in place at the lip of the Mulholland turnout. I was perspiring profusely now, giant pools of sweat darkening my arrow shirt below the armpits. I climbed out of the car and lit up a lucky, contributing to the many aromas the night sky had to offer. I knew I was only Clark Kent, but I wanted to be Superman, leaping from the brink of the Santa Monica Mountains in a single bound and flying through the air. My landing would be less elegant than George Reeves, perhaps, resulting in a pile of mangled flesh and shattered bone, but it was my party and I could fly if I wanted to. And at the moment, I wanted to. Or rather, the beckoning San Fernando Valley laid out before me wanted me to. A car pulled up and broke the spell. Teenagers looking for a spot to neck, and they were so hopped up they didn't think anything of pulling up within sight of another car. I tossed my lucky butt to the gravel, stomped it into lifelessness, climbed back into the Edsel, and backed away from my perch at the edge of the world. I peeled out, headed back down home, and went to bed. 
The next morning was like all the others. I woke up feeling like I was being born all over again. Not like a spiritual rebirth or reawakening or anything like that. Just like I was starting over every day. Like I had no history. Like I had no center. I felt like a puppet just going through the moves. I was overwhelmed with passivity, too laden with ennui to offer self-propulsion. When I was shooting, I was somebody. A director, a filmmaker, a guy who called the shots. When I was in between jobs, I was unmotivated, whiskered, an unidentifiable, unflying object, glued to the Motorola television from the early show to the late show, chasing the classics and eating my heart out. Unloved and unloving, poor me. Glad I had a job to energize me, I rose at dawn, shat, showered, and shaved, and drove off over the pass to Zuma Beach for our first day of location shooting. The drive over the mountains to the beach was inspirational. As the sun rose through the hazel morning scrim, I felt at the center of a three-dimensional world. The Edsel and I passed through it like a pinball. It surrounded me, swaddled me, put me at its center as I slid through it. Through the expansive windshield, billboards and trees and houses and overpasses enveloped me, and the sensation of approach and departure had new meaning. The changing depth of focus stimulated my visual senses as I drew closer, then farther from everything. My peripheral sight was filled with passing fancy, and I took it to the beach. I had seen before, but today I had vision. Aldo was already sitting on the sand in his chair, happily nursing his third orange juice of the morning, surely enhanced with Smirnoff, his eyes shaded by heavy foster grants when I arrived. The girls were still in makeup and Bill Thompson was lugging the giant 3D camera from his station wagon. What's the plan, Lee? He asked me. I'm glad you asked, I said. Let's see what we can do with this 3D thing. Let's make some magic. Inspired, even electrified by the morning drive, I got inventive. We lugged the camera under the lifeguard tower using the legs as foreground. I pictured every shot through a window, taking full advantages of the possibilities of three dimensions. Hell, maybe I could even talk the mucky mucks at Regal Royal into mixing the soundtrack stereophonic. I felt like a kid. I felt like I did on the Lancaster picture, energized and creative as I walked Bill through the day's setups. He was even older than me and not used to working up a sweat, but I could tell my enthusiasm was catching. We planned the day's work with wild Dutch angles, moves between the legs of the terrified beachgoers, a traveling chest-high shot of the blooming bodices of our beach girls. Feminine pulchritude may well be the cheapest, most satisfying special effect, and we had plenty of it. I even had him whip together an underwater housing so we could get some shots of the creatures swimming at, past, and around us in all their distinctive dimensions. I smiled as the girls came out of makeup. Even in Finn and Gills, these ladies were sexy little numbers. Hell, maybe because of the fish parts, I don't know. Their bikinis were teeny, their bosoms anything but. When these luscious young lovelies came bouncing out of the surf, the global temperature was sure to rise. The setups came a lot slower in 3D than on a conventional picture because the camera was so damn big and so hard to lug around. I tried to talk the powers that be into another day or two so we could shoot some more moving shots, movement being where you can really do something with 3D, but they were businessmen. They had no vision. They were paying me, sort of, for mine, but not letting it off the leash. I did what I could, and to tell you the truth, this was coming together a lot better than anything called She Creatures of Moritau Reef had any right to. I wasn't even going to mind putting my name on this ugly little duckling of a picture. I started to wonder what Busby Berkeley would have done with this technology. Can you imagine what he'd have concocted in your face with all those kaleidoscopic shots and his dozens of dancing doyens in three dimensions? That inspired me all over again, and I had the grips whip up a high tower to shoot directly down on the she-creatures as they emerged from the water. I had them construct a rope pulley system that allowed me to drop down and in on them, a poor man's stage crane right out in the middle of Zuma Beach. I knew this shouldn't have been so much fun, but against all expectations, I was having the time of my life. I felt like a juvenile delinquent. All I needed was a duck tail. The sun began to drop, and I wished we were able to shoot in Technicolor. 
The sunset was downright breathtaking, a palette of reds and pinks and purples I had never seen before. The sun's last grin on the horizon spread out over the Pacific Ocean in a glorious yellow-orange ripple. We'd put in a pretty damn good day, and the cast and crew were justifiably tired, but still smiling. As the thespians and their drones loaded up for home, I stayed behind, dazzled by the purple fall of evening, needing to see the full spread of night smother the coast. Before long, it was just me and my new best friend, the vast Pacific, sending in its tide in hungry little waves. I was hypnotized by the deepening waters, entranced by the foaming little crests that lapped lazily at the shore. The sirens of the night were calling my name. The sea settled as the moon and its attendant stars emerged, reflected in the newly darkened waters before me. For the first time, life itself seemed three-dimensional and in 360 degrees. Little fingers of salt water tickled my feet through my floor chimes, but I didn't give a shit. Soon, it was covering my shoes, threatening to climb up my pants. I didn't give it the chance. I stepped out into the water, relishing the little chill against my skin. My pants sucked the water up through the gabardine, and they stuck to my legs. I stepped even deeper into Mother Ocean as she tugged me to her breast. I felt the need to nurse from her. Deeper into the water I stepped, coming to a stop when it reached my waist. The briny scent surrounded me with its tang. I looked all around, tempted to let it pull me out into its vastness and have its way with me. I was at peace, and so was the sea, becoming so calm that its surface was turning to glass. If I so chose, I could just lie down on my back and let it float me to Hawaii. I wanted to be cast adrift. I wanted to be claimed by the water. I felt so, I don't know, fetal or something. I just wanted to go back into the amniotic fluid of the sea and return to the place of my birth. It would be so calm, so gentle, so simple, so utterly without stress. I almost gave in to my ultimate passivity, eager to swim with the fishes when I simply turned my head and changed my mind. What the fuck was up with me? Was I trying to kill myself? This was one happy goddamn day and I don't get too many of those anymore. Things were looking up. What was the attraction to my own demise? They talk about this subconscious psychological mumbo-jumbo all the time, but you know, like Freud says, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Hell, maybe there's something to this head shrinker stuff. I thought that tomorrow I'd put in a call to Dr. Michelson and get a recommendation. But for now, I was all wet, so I climbed out of the sea like that lady on the clamshell and headed for the Edsel. By now, the traffic to the valley was light, and my drive home to Studio City was uneventful and scored by Peggy Lee, Perry Como, and Mitch Miller. I called it home, but it was just a rental. Comfortable, even if anonymously furnished, the little hillside bungalow was just a place to flop and make plans. It seemed particularly lonely that night after the flurry of activity and the sudden family that is a film crew. I missed my wife, at least until I thought about what that meant. I missed Mara. Hell, I guess I even missed Aldo. The starburst wall clock above the faux fireplace ticked loudly through the otherwise silent room. Jack Parr was on the TV with the sound off as I sat working on my notes for tomorrow's work. But the pad on the card table before me was blank, and I tapped on it with my ballpoint, trying to work up an idea. Shecky Green was Parr's guest, and he must have said something awfully goddamn funny because Parr and the audience were in tears. I stared at the screen, which cast a blue corona of light across the wall-to-wall -wall carpet. I wanted to laugh, too, but I just couldn't work up the energy to cross the room and turn up the volume. So I pulled my attention from the cathode-rayed eye magnet and back to the page before me. I hadn't noticed, but I'd been doodling right in the center of the page, a great big spiral. It was one of those hypnotic eye type things, you know, just circling and circling and circling. As I went over and over the spiral, the end of the pen nearest me did a little circular dance. I don't know what my hands were doing. I was entranced by the pen's little terpsichorean movement. The pen was expensive for a ballpoint, a little thank you gift from John Newland for helping him out. It was buffed, shiny, Tiffany silver, sleek and dagger-like, gleaming under the harsh light of the pole lamp that stared down from over my head. I lifted the pen, 
and could actually make out my distorted, elongated reflection in its surface. I turned its point to face me, wiping off the little glob of ink that had collected there. I drew the pen close to my face, then closer. What would happen, I wondered, if I just kept bringing it closer? I held it an inch in front of my right eyeball. What would happen if I pulled it in through the retina, entering the bullseye of the pupil and eventually into my own brain? Would I hit a tickle center and start to laugh uproariously? Would I release an aqueous sense of humor to gush across my face? Or would it be unbearably painful? I held the pen still, just half an inch away from my retina, amazed at how steady my hand was. It didn't jiggle a jot. I drew it even closer, and I swear I could feel the chill of the silver. I wanted to inscribe something on my own eyeball, but I didn't know what. Hypnotized by the gleaming pen, I wanted penetration. Suddenly, the light from the television changed, and Jack and Shecky had given way to the test pattern Indian chief that signified the Channel 4 had gone off the air for the night. I dropped the pen to the table and stared at it in horror. Jesus, how long had I been holding it there? I looked down at the spiral I had drawn on the pad on the card table and realized it was time for bed. I had to be up at dawn for work. Hell, I could suss out the details on the set. All those directors on the high-priced studio pictures seemed to. One more belt, and I was fast asleep before I could even bother to brush my teeth. Back to the beach. Craft service had lugged in the requisite donuts, and I staked a claim on the lemon filled. Aristocracy on the film set has its privileges, even on a royal or regal set. I was alive even before the usual three cups of high-test black coffee, and was stocking my shots even before the first AD got there. Some rock and roll combo was going to be setting up to play on the beach in our big scene, my first musical number. She Creatures and a Negro singer I had never heard of called Chubby Checker, I guess they couldn't afford Fats Domino, of whom I was an enormous fan, with something called The Twist. We would test the artistic boundaries of 3D technology today, that's for sure. We spent a luxurious three hours choreographing and rehearsing the band, the dancers, and the She Creature attack, and frankly, I won't tried to work in some of that Busby Berkeley magic with our rope pulley at a jury-rigged dolly that could carry the immense camera. I got as fancy-schmancy with the setups as I could on this tight schedule, but if you don't mind my saying so, I think it was going to be a pretty impressive number. Maybe we could show Arkoff a little something about how to stage one of these teenager monster pictures. It was all going swimmingly. Sorry. Chubby's song turned out to be a pretty nifty little tune you could dance to. Maybe they could even get some airplay with it. If his little dance caught on, it would be good for the picture. The girls were stunning, fins and all. We had a bunch of local kids there to dance, and they seemed pretty happy so long as we kept the hot dogs and root beer coming. They seemed to get a charge out of the music, too. I decided that I had to ride the beast myself. I hadn't operated cameras since the turn of the last decade, but I was having such a good time that I had to climb back on the horse. Spirits were high and the music playback was loud. Surrounded by all these kids and their music, it felt like American bandstand on the beach. It took two dolly grips to shove me and the camera through the dancers and past Chubby as the amphibious girls broke out of the waves and charged into the routine. They were troopers, these chicks. Casting had recruited them from the burly clubs on the strip and a couple of the shadier modeling agencies in town, but they were game and beautiful and weren't afraid to show a little skin. Or a lot. So I was charging through the action, my eye pressed against the viewfinder, when the glamorous queen of the she-creatures, Miss Mara Corday, emerged regally from the depths of the sea, trailing seaweed and webbed feet, and it was quite a sight. Creepy and sexy at the same time. Her remarkable breasts were holstered by a seashell brassiere, and her stride was slinky, confident, even a little sinister. She approached the camera as the camera approached her, her eyes pinning the lens and catching the light just so. And then the -the jack-in-the-box moment. Just as she filled the frame with her magnificence, the sea beast sprang up behind her, a giant, green, fang-filled fish head with scaly claws and a mighty roar. There wouldn't be a dry seat in the theater. It even made me jump. 
Unfortunately, Janos, the guy in the rubber monster suit, was not known for his grace. As he rose from the brine, one scaly, finny foot slapped onto the other, and he went tumbling fish head first into the delectable Miss Corday, snagging her delicate seashell holster and popping it free of her notable assets, which in turn came crashing into the giant camera. She shouted as she fell against the machinery titty first, leaving an unmistakable nipple print in the center of the lens like a kiss. She shouted, and I screamed. You see, Janos fell into Mora, who fell into the camera, which crammed the viewfinder deep into my eye socket, bursting the eyeball and sending its liquid center down the right side of my face like a wash of tears. I pulled away from the camera with a wet, smacking I'm told that Mara kicked Janos right in the jewels, she was so furious, but I was preoccupied. I could see the deflated white sack of my eyeball, or what was left of it, dangling innocently from the viewfinder. I spun around, not knowing where to turn or what to do. The eye was ab obviously beyond salvation, but there was no pain. It was just the horror of it, the old EC comic style injury to the eye motif. But worst of all was that hideous pop, wet, sharp, gelid, and instantly deflating. It took a while for anyone to notice. The scene was rowdy to begin with, with that twist music and all, and the kids were really hamming it up with the dancing and the cutie pie fish girls. What with Mara and then the monster, well, it was all pretty cacophonous. There were screams aplenty before I tossed my own shriek into the mix. Maybe they thought that was direction or something. But while everybody was huddled around Mara, tending to her delicate situation, or more likely trying to catch a peep of her suddenly uncensored display of pulchritude, I was left to my own cyclopean devices. At least for a while. I held my hand against the newly vacant socket, the tip of my little finger accidentally dipping into the evacuated orbital cave like a nacho into salsa, and it was at that point that I lost our lavishly catered lunch. Suddenly, Yano seemed a lot less than scary. His phony baloney fish suit just seemed silly on the klutz. You could even see the goddamn zipper, for Christ's sake. No, clarity of vision was foisted suddenly upon me through one eye. I stood at the center of the maelstrom like the star of a Bert I. Gordon picture, and it was not pretty. There was a loud, long screech as somebody knocked the needle across the record we used for playback, and the mob went quiet when they saw me drop my gore-soaked fingers from my face, only to see the gaping red and black hole where my eye used to be. I stood dazed and confused in the center of this clear sill ad, striking terror into the hearts of the kids who were our future. I was about to win the sympathy vote. I woke up in an eighth-story room at St. John's in Santa Monica, thick gauze bandages covering my eye. Mara was there, a single gentle tear clearing a line of pale white flesh from under her foundation. Bert was there, too, looking pale and horrified. They tried to offer me a brave smile, but I could see the horror, distaste, and pity beneath it. A paunchy, silver-haired doctor, all in white like the room itself, gave them a private nod, and they left me to face the music alone. I was a little loopy from whatever medications had sent me flying, but I was calm, too. I knew what had happened. Well, I said. The doctor took a deep, theatrical breath. I'm afraid you've lost an eye, Mr. Benton. Like hell, I told him. I beg your pardon? I haven't lost a damn thing. It was hanging right there on the viewfinder like the morning laundry. He didn't know how to react, but I let him know that it was okay to smile. So he did. But it was fake and didn't look very good on him. I think he preferred the grave, professional look. Despite the new hole in my head, I felt okay. I mean, it was no treat to only see from one side of my nose, but I could live with that. I asked him to send in Mara and Bert in that order, preferably, and they came in sheepishly, not knowing how to act. I wanted to put them at ease. I guess it's just a holdover from the job. I was the patient, but I wanted them to be comfortable. I'll tell you something. I'm not getting one of those Sammy Davis Jr. glass eyes, that's for sure. I don't want anybody trying to figure out which eye to talk to. I'm just going to wear a patch like a pirate. Maybe get a little of that John Ford respect. What do you think, Bert? Mara and Bert exchanged a look. This wasn't going to be as difficult as they thought. 
that's right, Bert said, his drooping jowls lifting at the corners. I think we can make this work for you. You even got into this morning's times. Front page or metro, I asked. Metro. Well, it's better than a poke in the eye. Oops. Too meaningful. It wasn't what I intended, but I'll take a joke wherever I can find one, even if I made it myself. Mara came over and gingerly settled her petite keister onto the corner of the bed. She laid a delicate porcelain hand gently on one of mine and asked, How do you feel? A hell of a lot better now, I told her with a smile I hoped she wouldn't consider hungry. Don't tell Dick how much better I feel. I knew she wouldn't. Naughty, she lightly slapped my wrist. It's the pills talking. She took that for an answer for the time being at least. I saw a figure flash past my newly abridged peripheral vision, just to the right of the mountain of my nose. I turned, but didn't see anybody. Who was that? Who was what, Bert said. I just saw someone over in the corner. The three of them looked at each other like in an old Laurel and Hardy short. The doctor, wise man of science that he was, said it must have been the shadow of somebody walking past the door. That worked for the moment. There were more important things on my mind. So Bert, he raised his eyebrows in anticipation. What's the company doing with the production? The jowls dropped again. Let's talk about that a little later. Let's get you back in peak fighting form. They're not taking an insurance claim, are they? What insurance would that be? This isn't a studio picture, Lee. Are they going to wait for me? Mara was getting exceedingly uncomfortable now, and though she could buy me off with a good night kiss. Well, she was right. She leaned over me, offering me a glimpse of her Himalayan beauty, and painted a blood-red tulip imprint on my forehead. I've got to go now, Lee. I'm glad to see you're doing okay. Her face flushed a bit. She hurried out of the room. I looked back at Bert, who was squirming. Are they replacing me? Bert nodded. Replaced. Past tense. Already? Jesus, it's barely been a day. I did what I could, but this is a low-budget thing, Lee. They can't afford to lose a single day. They're shooting now. My single eye was unblinking. Who'd they get, Bert? Who's replacing me? They got some guy who really loves the spooky science fiction stuff. Fella named Eddie Wood. They say he's good with a nickel. Turns it into a quarter. I sighed, my good humor evaporating. I think I'd like to get a little rest now. Lee Givens whined. You can't direct a 3D movie with one eye. It ain't the job, Bert, I told him. Just allow me a few moments of solitary meditative depression, would you? Both doctor and agent were happy to leave me alone in the room. It was all white, like I said. Even the sunlight flooding the room was a harsh, smoggy white. It all seemed so flat, so utterly without contour, shape, or subtlety. Then I remembered that I was seeing it through a single eye. Of course it was flat. I could only see in two dimensions now. It was at that moment that I realized how I'd spent my life seeing in two dimensions, an entire lifetime of viewing life through the lens. It took the removal of an eye and the third dimension to allow me to see. Oh, Christ, the irony. And there he was again. That was no fucking shadow this time. I whipped my head around, but the dark whisk of a figure was nowhere to be found. And he'd be easy to spot, even only in height and width. But he was gone. I stood up from the hospital bed and almost collapsed as the blood rushed from my cerebral cortex. I grabbed onto the bed rail as my brain whirled like a merry-go-round. Maybe I wasn't as okay as I thought I was. As horrible as it sounds to lose an eye, and don't get me wrong, it's pretty fucking awful. Recovery time, at least in my case, was not that big a deal. The eye had come out in a clean pop, breaking free of the ganglia with a clean rip. Not a whole lot of nerve endings there, at least the kind that give you pain. So the doctor and the funk and wagnalls tell me. Sure, there was the danger of infection, but they'd gotten to it pretty quickly and efficiently, and I wore my patch with pride. Maybe I could get some dime store Picasso to paint a nice blue eyeball on it or something. After a few days, I went home to convalesce in my little Studio City bungalow, just me and my remaining eyeball alone in front of the television. I wondered what this Wood character was doing with my movie, how he was surely fucking it up. I'd actually worked up a good deal of enthusiasm for our little cinematic mutt, and now it was smoke. I had mixed feelings about the movie. 
I wanted it to be good because of all the work I'd put into it, but I wanted it to be a piece of shit because this new character they brought in the next day to replace me had surely botched it beyond redemption. I wanted Regal Royal to notice the difference. Hell, I could have finished the picture. They could have pushed a few days. I was up to it. I fell asleep in front of Sands of Iwo Jima on the Philco, the painkillers I thought were unnecessary having sung me a lullaby. I woke up to the star-spangled banner pronouncing the end to another broadcast day, and my entire head was throbbing. A shot glass was gripped tightly in my hand, but it was empty. It was time for bed. I headed into the bathroom and brushed my teeth, the Ipana sickeningly sweet through the scrim of bourbon. As I spat into the sink, there it was again over the bridge of my nose, a man, or at least his silhouette, and it looked like he was standing in the shower. I snapped my head around so fast that I could have sued myself for whiplash. But when I faced the tub, there was nothing there but a cake of dial. Who's there, I shouted, knowing there would be no reply. And I was right. The little house on the hill just sat there in silent defiance. Unnerved, I finished my evening toilet and headed for bed. I climbed under the covers in my undershoot and BVDs, but there was to be no sleep for me that night. Even under the influence of the painkillers and half a fifth of bourbon, and it was good Kentucky stuff too, I spent a watchful night awake. Shadows from the jacarandas outside reached across the bed and onto the floor like spiny arms and spindly fingers, but that was not what I saw. I saw a man, and damn it, I knew it was not a hallucination. Just as I rolled over onto my side and was about to drift off to slumber, I was eager to embrace. I spotted him again in my periphery, sitting in the chair opposite and watching me. I sat up with a jerk, just like in one of those cheesy dream sequences that are getting so popular and overused these days. You've got it figured out by now, and I don't need to state the obvious. Do I really have to tell you there was nothing there? But this was the weird thing. Now that I've got one eye, Everything looks like a movie to me, just flat and without shape. I mean, I can see the shapes, but it's knowledge of how the physics of form function from years of experience. But it's like a movie or a photograph, and there is no true depth. In other words, it's easy for me to bump into things, and I do it all the time. But this guy, whoever he was, had form and shape and three goddamn dimensions. But I wasn't seeing him with my eye. I saw him with the eye that's missing, with the socket that used to have an eye. He was only in my peripheral vision, like through my psychic eye or something. Because when I turned to see him with the eye that could see, the solitary orb still connected to my brain, there was no trace of him. Hell, I say him, and I sure thought it was the same guy every time. But perhaps I was wrong. Maybe there was an entire world on the other side of my nose that I was not aware of like another dimension, a fourth or fifth, or something that was calling out to me. If that was the case, however, they were doing a pretty lousy job of it. This fellow or these fellows kept slipping away each time I tried to see them. Of course, it might have been my own fault. I was trying to see him when he couldn't be seen in the traditional sense. Maybe there was a better way to communicate with him, if there was a him in the first place. The sun rose and I was cooked for the day. I don't sleep easily under the best of circumstances, and this was among the worst. Once the sun was up, sleep was beyond my reach, and I was doomed to a day of wakefulness. The morning heat predicted that the sun was going to be brutal that day, and a box of light scorched through the little cottage through the picture window. My eye was bleary and bloodshot, and my brain throbbed. The vista between the bridge of my nose and the grand view to its right was bleached bright, and my head listed to the side to support it. It's a good thing I never shot a picture in CinemaScope. I'd have to constantly be turning my head from side to side just to see the damn thing. I stumbled into the bathroom and soaked my head under the cold water faucet. That woke me up, but it didn't stop the throbbing. It also did not discourage fresh appearances by my new best friend. It seemed that he was now at every corner, a dark shadow at every juncture, waiting to share a secret with me. But at each and every turn, he vanished. Of course, he couldn't vanish if he were never really there, could he? I stepped out onto the porch and picked up the paper, and there he was, just outside the door. 
I took the times into the kitchen and started some coffee brewing, and there was a glimpse of him just behind the refrigerator. Tell me what the fuck you want, I screamed at him, but there was no answer. Not that I really expected one. I threw the paper down on the kitchen table and opened it up to the crossword puzzle while I waited for the coffee to brew. As I looked down at the puzzle and started to fill in the little letter blocks, I could sense his shadow and shape standing over me, just to my left. This time, however, I did not look up. His shadow blocked my puzzle with darkness, and with throbbing head and shaking hands, I closed my eye in fear and gripped the pencil tight. I could feel his presence hovering over me as I baked in the window of sunlight that slowly crept over me. My heart was pounding like the score to Ben-Hur. I could barely take a breath. I could feel his heat emanating. He was so close. I gradually lifted my head, never daring to open the eye that could see. Through my closed eyelid, I saw moiré patterns, rushing blood cells, little bursting sparks of brightness in the red blackness. But beyond that, I saw a man. Though I could not see the kitchen, its walls, the refrigerator, the oven, the sink, or even the windows, my closed eye was filled with summer sunlight. And in front of that eyelid-diffused light, the man still stood. He appeared as a silhouette at first, even through my closed eye, swaddled in the sunlight. His shape was sharply defined. He was about my height, it seemed, and appeared to be going to paunch. As I adjusted to the sunlight, his features became clearer under the hat that shaded him. His face bristled with several days of neglect. His posture was tired but needy. I could make out his mouth. He was trying to speak to me. Soon, a light bloomed around him, and the mallet of realization clobbered me with its full force. It was like staring into a mirror, except for the two cool blue eyes staring beseechingly at me. The man was me. Was he my ghost? Had I died during the night, or even earlier? I knew if I opened my eye, my contact with my doppelganger would dissipate, so I dared not. I quenched my eye tighter, and he became clearer. He reached toward me with his hands as he spoke, but it was as silent as a Buster Keaton two-reeler. What the hell was I trying to tell me? The me with two eyes, the one standing over me casting a shadow which would disappear if I opened my eye, really needed me to hear what he had to say. He was shouting, but there wasn't a sound coming from his mouth, and I was a lousy lip reader. I could tell it was important that I was being beseeched, but what was he trying to tell me? From the looks of the other me's expression, it was a matter of life and death, something I direly needed to know. He, I, knew something I didn't know, and my heart began to pound. I felt that I beheld the secret of life and death, or that I was on death's boundary. My two-eyed guide was reaching out to me, begging me to hear him. Maybe he knew what this whole veil of tears was about. Perhaps he could help me find meaning in the five decades that had made up this thing called my life. Or maybe, just maybe, he stood on the threshold of another world, a fourth dimension, one you couldn't enter just by wearing funny cardboard glasses. He pointed down at my hand with his, but I didn't see anything at first. I thought maybe there was a message in the crossword puzzle, and I asked him if that were the case. He shook his head, violently, but just kept pointing, saying something I just could not hear. Then the curtain parted as I looked down at the pencil, gripped tightly in my right hand. I looked up at him, and he smiled a smile that reached both his eyes. I lifted the pencil, and he nodded, slowly at first, like one of those phony birds that dips his head into a glass of water, but then more forcefully. I stared at the pencil, finally figuring it out. If I could only see him, or me, after losing an eye, I knew what I must do to hear or what he, or I, was so desperate to tell me. I had to hear what he had to say. I had to take that step into what lay beyond the silver screen of Hollywood vision. I slowly lifted the pencil up, then, with all my might, slammed it deep into my right ear. The sound was deafening.